Shipra, I think we can start. We have a good number of participants and I think some of the errors have been fixed. So at least some of the people who had said they had problems, they have managed to join now. Very good. Thanks, Anne. Um, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, colleagues. It's very nice to uh, to see some of you on my screen, some after a very long time. Uh, I welcome to this expert group meeting on urban governance, uh, which we are we at UN Habitat are very, very excited about. My name is Shipra Naransuri. I'm the chief of urban practices at UN Habitat, and I will be moderating the first part of uh, today's discussions, including this, this opening uh, segment as well as the, the next dialogue. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me invite Raf Tuts, our uh, Director of Global Solutions, to maybe provide us some opening remarks and some framing thoughts uh, for the conversations to follow over the two days. Raf. Thank you, Shipra. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, a good day to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, on behalf of UN Habitat, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this um, expert group meeting on urban governance. And it's um, a good uh, topic to revisit after two decades of work on this topic uh, in UN Habitat and um, in other parts uh, of partner organizations. In our work, uh, we have our vision of our organization of a better quality of life for all in an urbanizing world. And that's a very bold and ambitious uh, vision. And we are breaking this down into a number of um, uh, goals. One is to help to achieve SDG 11, which is to build inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable cities and communities. And we're also uh, promoting uh, the implementation of the new urban agenda uh, to um, use urbanization as a positive transformative force for people and communities to reduce inequality, discrimination and poverty. And governance and urban governance is a key driver to achieve all this. In fact, our strategic plan has explicitly identified governance as one of the drivers to achieve these higher level goals of um, fighting inequality, fighting climate uh, change and um, poverty in, in our world. Now, there is a history to this uh, topic. Uh, in fact, it dates back to 1986 when the Urban Management Program introduced uh, the, the notion of urban governance in UN Habitat's work. This was a global uh, program initially together with the World Bank and UNDP and, um, and Habitat. And that led into the global campaign on urban governance, which ran from 2001 to 2005. And I was happy also to be associated as well as other colleagues who are on this call to be associated with this campaign, which um, I help to define what we mean by good urban governance, uh, help to develop uh, an indicators framework for urban governance, and also help to develop a number of partnerships with organizations, some of which we're still working um, up to today. So we have been able over these two decades to provide normative and operational support to uh, local and national government authorities in formulation of rights-based governance frameworks. So we have done that over the last 20 years. But now things have changed. The concept of governance has uh, evolved. It's a complex um, uh, concept and the understanding has evolved. And um, the approaches to implement it has also, have also evolved. It is a multi-dimensional um, concept because the decisions in a governance environment are built on very complex relationships between different actors, uh, different interests, different mandates, and also power relationships. So as a result, we have very often competing approaches that we have to apply at different territorial scales, leading sometimes to waste of resources sometimes to inefficient sectoral interventions 
and at times also to human rights violations, despite um, a certain governance uh, construct. And it is in reconciling these competing priorities and these challenges should be at the heart of the concept of um, urban governance. Now, the new urban agenda, which I've uh, mentioned already, is really elevating governance as one of the key drivers for change towards sustainable urbanization, alongside with policy and legislation, planning and financing of urban development. It is also at the heart of our strategic plan, and uh, it is important to note that the driver of governance is context specific. So when we work with cities and countries, we need to develop tailor-made context specific means of implementing governance um, and try to overcome barriers that there are in different countries in different cities to the full implementation of these ideal governance solutions. So we see this as a tool to accelerate the implementation of both the new urban agenda and the strategic plan of UN Habitat, which is now um, almost one and a half year into its four year um, uh, road. I would like to now shift a little bit to talk about the pandemic and the way this is affecting uh, governance relationship. UN Habitat recently launched a report on cities and pandemics towards a more just, green and healthy future. This report uh, outlines how cities could lead the move towards a new social contract between governments, civil society and private sector to reduce poverty and inequality, provide adequate housing and strengthen social protection while rebuilding from the pandemic in a just, green and healthy way. So this report highlights the need for more integrated, cooperative and multi-level governance arrangements, with the emphasis also on developing more flexible and innovative institutional and financial frameworks to achieve this. The pandemic has also underscored the relevance for uh, promoting inclusive multilateralism. Now more than ever, countries and intergovernmental platforms help, can help to identify solutions to shared problems and arrive at common approaches to global policy challenges. And this um, extends much uh, beyond the much needed coordination of health and humanitarian assistance in the context of the pandemic, but it also includes opportunities for governments to promote global policies on housing, on basic services, on income support, on urban and regional planning, neighborhood and building design, local economic development, infrastructure investment, and digital technological assets. So you see that inclusive governance leading to better ways of working together has an impact at a very uh, large diversified scale. It's only through shared responsibility and collective action that governmental and non-governmental actors can come together to ensure that all people realize their potential as members of an interconnected, fragile and uh, planetary ecosystem. Our Secretary General, in last year's address to the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, uh, which was entitled Tackling the Inequality Pandemic, a new social contract for a new era, he articulated a vision of our collective future to address inequality head on. And he noted that COVID-19 has been likened to an X-ray, revealing fractures in the fragile skeleton of the societies which we have built. And he also argued that by rendering visible multiple forms of discrimination, racism and xenophobia, the pandemic has given us a once in a lifetime a uh, chance to take the actions that are required to confront the structures that are underpinning the systematic inequality. The price, if we choose to take it, could be extraordinary, and it's an opportunity to build back a more equal and sustainable world. So we are realizing that participatory urban governance could help in build bridges, reconcile the society to achieve 
this OM that was so well articulated by the Secretary General. So now we have, we are together today and tomorrow uh, after 20 years of evolution and learning about governance and also indeed what the pandemic, the current pandemic has taught us about governance relationship. So I'm really looking forward to the contributions of the experts and the practice, practitioners that have been gathered today here to devise a strategic focus on urban governance, an innovative focus, a new focus to be able for governance to act as a catalyst for a better quality of life in an urbanizing world. It's my hope that the discussions and the action points, very important, from today's and tomorrow's meeting, which will cover topics such as global, multi-level, multi-stakeholder and digital governance, that these action points will deliver lasting and sustainable approaches that leave no place and no one behind. So thank you so much again for your time, your commitment on these pertinent issues, and I'm really looking forward to the lively discussions and to a renewed approach to urban governance for you and Habitat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ra, Thank you, Ra. Uh, for sharing both those um, the the historical evolution of uh, UN Habitat's work, its conceptualization on governance, its partnerships, as well as the most current thinking that has come out in the Cities and Pandemics report, which I think together uh, provide us with uh, with uh, the frame for discussions. And indeed, we share your hope about. Uh, a renewed uh, conceptualization, a renewed focus, and a renewed commitment to urban governance, uh, both within Habitat and with partners. Thank you again. Let's move uh, now to um, a presentation or a brief presentation on the findings of a survey that we did before uh, this expert group meeting in order to, in fact, inform how we should focus and what we should do uh, at this expert group meeting. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, straight after that, we will have four short interventions from our regional directors presenting the regional perspective of um, from, from different corners of the world and different corners of UN Habitat. But let me now give the floor to another wrap. Rafael Ferrero uh, for presentation on uh, on the survey results. Rafa, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Shipra. I hope uh, you are hearing me well. Good uh, morning from Bogota. Good afternoon. Good evening to all of you. I am uh, sharing my screen right now. Can you confirm if you are seeing it? I hope you are seeing my screen. OK, thank you. Yes, I am in London. Yeah. Thank you, thank you all. So, um, as Chipra said, these are the results from the survey on governance. We shared it with you before the event. Uh, this is a, a very quick and straightforward presentation. We just like to highlight some of the most interesting and, and uh, most repeated responses. First, the scope of the responses, the, the geographic distribution from people who respond uh, the, the survey, we can see that mostly of the responses comes from uh, Europe, West Europe and North America. Uh, we also have some replies from Latin America, specifically from Bolivia, uh, from, um, from Brazil, from our regional office. Uh, and from Africa, we have some replies from Sudan, from South Africa and of course uh, from, Na from Nairobi. Uh, also, we have a couple of countries a couple of replies from uh, Arab states, specifically uh, Syria and Saudi Arabia. And finally, uh, we have some replies from the uh, Republic of Korea. If you see mostly of the, of the replies uh, corresponding with international experts, uh, people uh, classify it as international experts, mainly academia and uh, UN entities. Uh, we have a total of 23 replies uh, of the survey. Uh, then, uh, on principles of governance, we have this cloud with the most repeated uh, words uh, throughout the survey, and we uh, it's important to, to highlight words like transparency, accountability, participation, but also we have uh, another kind of, of expression referring governance, like effective governance, uh, like rules of law, human rights, civil engagement, 
uh, and so on. You can you can see uh, in your screen all the all the words and all the principles that were referred by experts when talking about governance. Um, then uh, this is this is very interesting uh, reply because these are the key governance challenges identified by the by the experts. Uh, but you can see that they are very very uh, divergent and very uh, wide also because you you have a general uh, replies like rapid urbanization, but you have also a specific replies like for instance. A limited evidence based decision making, like weak fiscal and human capacity, limited civil participation, poor education systems. But the, the, there is uh, something uh, very curious about this because uh, if you actually, if you change the title of this slide and you put key, go, uh, key urbanization or, or key urban sustainable challenges, uh, it also works. And I think this is interesting because this means that uh, effectively the, the governance approach and the governance vision that the expert has have uh, is very transversal, no? Is is very general, uh, and it, there are several uh, similarities and linkages between urbanization and governance, uh, at least as as identified by the experts. Uh, then you have uh, some entry points uh, for speaking about governance in UN habitat within UN habitat, and you can see that this uh, has have also some similarities with our internal distributions uh, and with our internal uh, subjects or, or thematic areas or thematic themes. For instance, you can see economy and finance, legislation, human rights, uh, public space, digital governance, climate change, land administration, inclusory planning and resilience and mapping. Mostly of them correspond uh, actually with the internal uh, division on, on technical teams from UN. Rafa, we have that. Okay, you're back. Rafa. Okay, continue. I think we can see you. You can yeah. you can hear me again? Yes. I think I am having some some uh, problems with my internet. I am I am not sure if you are seeing the presentation. We are we are. Okay, so I was in the in the last slide. I was seeing the cross cutting approaches identified by the experts uh, and some specific ideas on tools to be developed by UN Habitat. And here we can find a more specific replies, for instance, suggestions on developing tools on evidence-based decision making or institutional governance assessment tools, anti-corruption campaign, democratic governance models, and so on. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is all. This is the most uh, common and important replies from the, from the survey. And I hope this be useful for the discussion. Thank you, Shipra, and over to you again. Thank you, Rafa, and uh, thanks for that. Um, um, interesting, and of course, uh, some are not surprising. I'm happy to see that uh, the fundamentals of good governance remain strong in terms of uh, the principles, transparency, accountability, rule of law, participation, all very strongly highlighted in that discussion. In a sense, it reinforces the message that governance is connected to everything and our pursuit of sustainable development, and also that good, un good governance will underpin our impacts and our successes fundamentally. So that's quite, quite interesting. And thank you also for all those who responded with ideas for, for what we can do together. 
OK, let's move on now to some regional perspectives. And let me first of all call upon uh, Dr. Arfan Ali, our regional director for the uh, from the Arab states region to share with us some insights on your context and your thoughts on the question of governance. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Uh, can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the screen. Okay, I removed the screen. Oh, sorry, one minute. Okay, okay. now you still, you can see the screen, Shipra? We can see your presentation. Thank you please. so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, to highlight on the urban or local governance in the Arab region. I'm so happy that Mr. Toots started with um, very um, important uh, um, introductory uh, remarks highlighted on the notion, because until now, uh, I, I should be very frank that there is a bit of um, uncertain um, definition or understanding of the uh, of the notion itself between urban or local governance. I put here on the screen the definition of UN Habitat. Uh, Mr. Toots uh, mentioned uh, our focus or the definition which focuses on the planning and managing the common affairs of of cities, taking into consideration the different. Uh, pillars or, or principles, including the social capital of citizens. And while the, I brought also another definition, which is very uh, um, widely used also in the region, which is the definition of our colleagues in UNDP, which um, uh, emphasize on the, um, or includes the um, subnational institutions, systems, and the processes. Uh, so that to, in order to enable the, the citizens or to, to enable citizens to articulate their uh, their their interests and needs at the uh, at the local level and for sure it focuses on the political uh, relationship between the different tiers of the local uh, governance so we do believe that now after 20 years as mentioned we need to uh, to update a streamline and uh, maybe adapt with the new realities with the digitalization with the challenge Challenges related to pandemics like COVID and other uh, issues. So I wanted to start with this because the, uh, the challenges in the in the Arab region are not really different from uh, what what also Rafael uh, presented. Uh, um, there are many many diverse challenges in the region related to uh, local governance, uh, including the rapid urbanization and other challenges. But here I wanted to focus or, or emphasize on uh, four main group of uh, uh, of challenges in the in the region or trends related to uh, to local uh, uh, governance in the region, we have large number of centralized state administration tradition, which is very well known, except in uh, historically for uh, uh, for cultural um, tribal reasons, some. Um, uh, some states or some countries um, uh, were or uh, built um, a particular uh, uh, tradition or a particular decentralized system because of the tribal nature of these communities, like in Libya or Sudan or in in, in Yemen. So uh, also in in the yeah, in in many countries in the region. Um, that decentralization was implemented or decentralization policies were implemented with varying degrees of, of success. Uh, so trying to bring governance closer to citizens and creating um, uh, uh, creating impact or uh, contributing to the local development in these uh, countries. The second group of, of uh, challenges or uh, um, uh, issues in the region are related to the fragmented and complex fragmented and complex um, um, geopolitical uh, situation in some uh, in some countries that affected or affected or resulted uh, uh, led to the ineffective implementation of decentralization in these uh, uh, um, in these countries. 
uh, also in many countries in the Arab region, we uh, uh, we uh, the, uh, the, 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 there is inadequate decentralization and un in particular finan financial decentralization. So um, um, the the mandate of the different different uh, layers of um, uh, local governance uh, with regard to financial management are not clear and or or very limited uh, role in terms of uh, financial management and here I bring the example of Egypt and um, and Iraq and the fourth group of challenges or trends in the region are uh, mainly related to the um, uh, to the level of engagement or the participation of citizens in the in the local governance or in in leading at the uh, uh, at the uh, at the local level for sure there are uh, after, especially after 2011 and the Arab Spring uh, due to security reasons due to political reasons Many countries also uh, uh, restricted or limited the, the the participation of their citizens in terms of uh, um, uh, local governance. Even in some countries, we know that uh, local local elections had been suspended since a few years now due to this uh, or since the the Arab Spring. Uh, here we see in this. In this mapping, we see the different uh, types of local governance. We tried to map uh, the, the different types in 13 countries in the region. Uh, most of the uh, countries where Rawas or the Regional Office of Arab State of UN Habitat is functioning, and I will not for sure go through all the different models of local governance in the region. I'll just refer to some examples, some uh, uh, examples like uh, like in Morocco. Uh, Morocco has one of the uh, most updated local governance system after the update after after the uh, uh, update of the constitution in 2011 um, uh, um, the, the the foundation of particip of participatory in the urban management or in the local government was strengthened after the implement after the adoption of this uh, or the endorsement of the new constitution, which focused a lot on citizens' involvement in the local issues, in the local governments, uh, governance. And um, this was uh, possible because of the notion, because of the new concept of the uh, uh, city's policies or uh, la politique de la ville in, in Morocco, which was endorsed in 2012 to lead or to guide the, the participation of citizens in managing the local affairs. This was also accompanied by certain uh, um, arrangements, including the uh, uh, in, including providing a, a very strong model on uh, municipal uh, uh, municipal fund to support the local development de local development at the in, in 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 Morocco. Another example I wanted to to mention is Tunisia. Uh, well, where in Tunisia we all know that there were a lot of challenges after that transition in 2011, after the revolution, and the challenges remain and. Uh, especially in, with regard to the coordination between the between the center and the the, the uh, provinces or the the, the provincial uh, uh, level however there were uh, s s very important and several steps practical steps ad to uh, have been taken to advance the citizens participation in the local governance uh, uh, issues even now some cities or some localities in in Tunisia like Sfakas, like Marsa they have they have applied the participatory budget programs since 2015. Another important example from the Mashriq area, this time from, uh, uh, from Lebanon, we have a very imp interesting model in Lebanon. It's one of the oldest municipal or local governance system in the, in the region, where we have a particular system related to the municipal unions, where municipal, municipalities are, uh, or unions were emerged for to enhance the city uh, or to enhance or to consolidate the capacities of municipalities at the, at the uh, local level. Iraq was one also of the uh, strong decentralized uh, uh, system for sure after 2003, after the change of the regime in the, um, in the country. There's a very strong act on decentralization was issued in 2000 and, uh, 2008. However, this uh, legal framework was not really fully applied. And until now, there's a huge um, uh, um, uh, argument about the implementation of this legislation related to, to decentralization. Um, and uh, uh, practically now, there is, there, there is a lot of overlapping between, between the center and the governorates or the governorates uh, council in terms of the financial management, in terms of the responsibility 
responsibilities, the coordination uh, in the different in the different areas of of uh, uh, services. Um, maybe I refer to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of the newly uh, um, established decentralization uh, uh, decentralization system. Although there were a lot of uh, challenges related to the citizens' participation, related to the lack of spatial uh, development strategy. Um, uh, huge steps had been undertaken in order to overcome all these that the challenges related to local governance. A new special strategy was developed through the support of the uh, future Saudi cities program with UN Habitat during the last four or five years. Local elections uh, uh, organized three times now in, in Saudi Arabia and women are able to vote and uh, 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 in, the, in the at the local level. So the last elections was in 2005. Uh, now I will just uh, for sure the presentation can be provided and the, the mapping of the local government system mm -hmm. could be could be further elaborated and discussed. I want to refer to three examples on the contribution or the work of UN Habitat in the Arab region. Very short, very in short. three minutes, very, in three minutes, uh, uh, Dr. Shipra. Uh, in Egypt, the example of Egypt, the focus of UN Habitat in, on enhancing local revenues, land-based finance, working also on introducing or uh, enhancing, uh, introducing the betterment levy for urban development projects. Also, we are working on the public financial mechanism, and I'm very happy that the, recently the land readjustment methodology was included in the amended uh, of the, uh, the amendment of the building law. Uh, uh, another example from Lebanon, I mentioned the municipal unions, UN Habitat, since the establishment in Lebanon in 2007, contributed to the build to, to, to building the capacities of the municipal unions by providing or establishing technical offices in these unions to facilitate to, to, to provide technical support capacity building and leading or supporting their capacity to, to, to plan and deliver their their basic services in Lebanon with a specific uh, also with a specific uh, focus on the disaster disaster risk management in, in uh, to, to be handled or to be addressed by the by the local level in Lebanon. Uh, another ex recent example also, this is a joint work between Habitat and UNDP to support the municipal uh, 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 resilience in Lebanon, mainly mainly to address issues or challenges related to the present, to the existence of the Syrian refugees with a specific focus on local economic development work in, in, at, at this level. The last example is from Syria, and here I wanted to conclude by the very important role of local governance and urban and well-guided urbanization, urbanization to sustain or in the uh, uh, to, su to sustain peace, especially in the context of post-conflict, like in Syria or Yemen or Libya. So this example, the EMTOS, the UN Habitat Municipality Technical Office Support Program, is trying to help the municipalities, the, the damaged municipalities, uh, to, mm -hmm. to rebuild their capacities to help citizens to return to their areas and to provide their services at the local level. I will not go through details. I will be happy to provide uh, uh, explanation about the detailed activities in this context. And thank you so much. Uh, 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 for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Shipra. Thank you so much, Dr. Erfan, and particularly for your last point, the role of governance, not just in and of itself, but the fundamental role of governance in building a sustainable peace. I think that that is really absolutely essential. And thank you for sharing both the mapping and those examples from your region. Let me move now to Omar Sela, my colleague and a friend and director of the Regional Office for Africa. Omar, the African perspective on local or urban governance. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shifra, and to the organizers of this webinar. So when it's come to Africa, of course, this is our governance is quite a very challenging and very loaded you know, concept in the context of Africa, globally speaking, because we see all these challenges we are facing in terms of leadership and even for some people, this bad governance is holding up you know, the, this, this uh, development of Africa. So now I think we have more concern. If we see this rapid trend of urbanization, as mentioned by Raphael in your presentation, uh, with the emerging you know, secondary and intermediate cities, which quite require more, you know, thought, food for thought for the level of uh, governance, what we need to have in Africa to manage our cities and town. I think the RAF has brought a big perspective on the importance of governance in building sustainable cities and town in Africa, but also in reducing poverty. 
So I think the response in Africa has been quite a long of time, you know, looking into the centralization process. That's why now my 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 thought is more about you know provocation and being some sort on the table as we are talking about response and catering, you know, our intervention in the way that we are supporting, you know, local government system in Africa and elsewhere, but particularly in the context of Africa, it is very important. I think what you learn from this decentralization is about promoting the subsidiarity. I know there's a lot of challenges associating with this process of decentralization, but this has been seen as a response, you know, to the issue of increasing urbanization, but also of creating another center for decision making. But when it comes to the concept of governance, I think the way that uh, Raf has framed it is very important because governance is a very complex context uh, concept, but also depending on context, you know, how specific, as mentioned by Erfan as well. For me, in the context of Africa, when it comes to governance, two elements most important, service delivery. Because one purpose of the, you know, associated to local government and governance system is making sure we are taking care of well-being of communities and population, which is about the service delivery system. The second point is citizen participation. I, I think we mentioned of that, creating a scope where people have a say on the trend, but also on the process of decision making on the way that we are promoting development and service delivery at the local level. I think those are some elements which have been in the center of the discussion uh, on governance in Africa. I think the UCLG has been leading on this particular discussion, but also we need to assess right now where we stand with the governance system. I think this is a, a historical perspective from RAF, but we shouldn't forget as well in Africa in 2005, I think local government come together and ministers through the arm should to discuss about the challenges of local governance in Africa related to urbanization. I think it's really timely to look at this trajectory where we are now. So what we see now is an evolution of the functions of the local government, for example. I think some have been put on the table by this, uh, you know, survey. First of all, what we see as an evolution, promoting investment. I think this is something which has been taken from central and bring it to the local level. What does it mean when it comes to investment and others? It means they're promoting partnership, type of partnership, public-private partnership, because when it comes to investment and locking those, uh, you know, potential is about being innovative, the way that we can bring, you know, private sector in the area. And it is fundamental for Africa, especially for secondary cities. If you really want to diversify livelihood system and facing all this <laughs> element of migration and movement of population and also creating territorial balance, which is in the center of UN Habitat Strategy Plan with this uh, special inequalities, we need to look at this aspect. And I think the second point for me, which is important, those new functions is local revenue generation and harnessing because uh, local government have been you know counting on central level in terms of transfer from central to local so now we see the need of having you know some kind of indigenous system of generating you know revenue for local government to be able to respond to the need of citizen in terms of service delivery and terms of other for public function what where we are under and most importantly building on the COVID 19 now we see the increased demand in terms of health system i think those are some element function we need to consider as well when we do this analysis the cities has been in the forefront of the pandemic of COVID 19 where that is secondary cities mega cities and intermediate cities and now in the face of recovery, I think there's a lot that lie on cities and municipalities and that. So I mean that in terms of governance, we need to look at what that we need in terms of institutions, in terms of means for those, for example, local government to respond to the need of recovery and respond to the COVID-19. And uh, lastly, the element of climate change, of course, resilient. And we see how secondary city, I just came from last week uh, from, uh, from Mozambique, from Beira, which is a secondary city which is hit by the cyclone. And this municipality is in the center of the reconstruction of resettlement of communities has been displaced. So it means that the service delivery is quite a very important, the high of the agenda of the reconstruction, and which is left on the hand of the local government. And lastly, something we have been discussing as well, uh, Shepra, the issue of reporting and voluntary local review system. So we are talking about that. This is a role now of local government. It's part of governance system as well, because that's something we see as an opportunity for citizen participation. But are we able to fulfill all those, you know, new functions in the context of Africa? I think that's the way the pessimism happened now, because we see the level of, of sophistication and complexities of our local government system in Africa. Mm -hmm. First element in terms of national, I mean, national weaknesses, I think Erfan has talked about a few of them. Of course, this decentralization has been seen as a panacea to increase democracy in the local level, but also to get more participation of citizens in the decision-making process. 
But we see this, uh, you know, limitation from constitutions and from regulatory framework. From there, now we can see a limited capacity, a limited, you know, power dedicated to the local government system. From there, they are very, you know, constrained some time and facing a lot of restriction in terms of decision making process. Uh, second element, financial capacity. I think we see all still, you know, these dependencies or local government to the central level. And uh, I mean, based on the challenges we are seeing and uh, the potential we have at the local level of enhancing the local revenue system, which is amazing in Africa, for example, but how much has been done? Uh, based on this uh, you know, analysis we do in Kisumu on the own source revenue, 70% of the local revenue is dormant. You have, you know, you know the, the city is only living with 13% of the potential of the revenue, which means that there is huge that we need to tap on it. But I see some progress happening. For example, in Kenya, I think there's quite improvement on this uh, parking system. For your information, two weeks back, I just parked five minutes somewhere in Westland. When I get home, I just got a, you know, a message on my phone telling me that I just breached, you know, the law, the bylaw on parking. I have to pay the fees. So which means there's some progress going on, but still a lot of work that to be done. And another constant is the political constant, of course, we know, because this local government system in many cities in Africa is mainly fulfilling the purpose of politics and not, you know, the objectivity of serving the purpose of citizen in terms of service delivery. And we see these purposes of, the, of election being on the paramount, you know, uh, priority of many agenda in Africa when it comes to decentralization. At the end of the day, all this territorial decoupage, all this territorial, you know, I mean, organization are meant to respond to some kind of electoral, you know, setup and not really the way of promoting participation. And those are some bottlenecks as well we are facing at local and national level. Uh, and, and lastly, I think something which is very important, which is coming from uh, Erfan presentation, limited citizen participation. And on that, when it comes to citizen participation, I think we need to look at different uh, angles. Yes, transparency, accountability, and other efficiencies are the basis principle, you know, of this participation. But why is this participation is not happening? Is that because of the political blockages? Is that a way of uh, you know, the mindset? Is that a level of, you know, of sophistication of the local governance system? I think that's something which is very important, especially in the context of youth bulk right now we are facing. I think in Senegal, I'm Senegalese, we just went through a crisis, you know, one month back because, uh, you know, youth was on the street and reclaiming more consideration in terms of access to job, in terms of participation and others. So I think this is something which is quite uh, very important and very sensitive, including women in the context of Africa right now, especially when it's come to cities and municipalities. So right now we are using this digital system as a way of connecting cities and citizens. But is that enough? I think those are some questions we need to ask our question, our, ourselves uh, when it comes to really to, to look into those challenges. Where should we go from now? Just some, some thinking, you know, on the way forward, especially for the group. So for me, I think first thing we need to do is revisiting UN habitat approach and tools on this issue of, of governance aspect, urban governance especially. I think Saraf has mentioned it. We start working on it years back. Now the context has evolved. We have new context, new reality. What does it mean for us for our tool? For example, one tool I was thinking about that we need to look at and adapt it to the context, this international guideline on decentralization and access to basic services. It is a very fundamental tool, which is speaking to the reality, but from international to national, how to bring it to the local level. And what does it mean for now in terms of response to COVID-19 with new emerging needs for communities and others? The second tool I need to highlight as well is this participation budgeting system as well. I think there's need on that for now. We are talking about accountability, transparency, access to information and redevability and others. So what are those tools we need to bring on the table? I think these tools are still important for us uh, to increase the level of participation, but also to enforce the element of accountability. Uh, but also let's look at you know, the gaps in terms of expertise. So talk about climate resilience, uh, we talk about own source revenue. What does it mean in terms of skills, you know, for, for local government to be able to perform those duties uh, without forgetting the conducive environment for this local government to happen? And from there, we need to touch on policy, regulatory framework, but also without ignoring the element of planning. Because right now in Africa, secondary cities are growing. First element we need to sort out is allocation of space 
And that's where you know, a lot of issues happening, land allocation, which is a major source of concern in Africa now, a major source of conflict in Africa now, because the lack of transparency, all of those elements, that's the reason why land use planning is very important in the context of governance in Africa right now. Uh, to finish, just something maybe on the pl collaborative platform. Of course, we have a lot of opportunity now to increase this level of democracy at the local level. So we have this voluntary local review system, but also we have UCLG who's playing, you know, master role in Africa. I think this collaborative platform is very important and, and improving as well, you know, this level of coalition and collaboration is very important. I just some, some sort of Shipra from my end, so I'm happy to get any question, but I'm sure more will come from us as colleague. Back to you. Thank a you lot much. of thoughts and a lot of good questions that you've raised, Omar. Big, good, big questions. But um, I, I don't like the word pessimism in your, in your, uh, um, in your reflections. <laughs> I um, know, I, I know. I think, I think from the depths of despair can arise the most innovative solutions. So let's look at it from that point of view. How right. can the African continent leapfrog, you know, some of the challenges and some of the trends and some of the, uh, the approaches that other continents have, have tried and perhaps failed with? Uh, to really bring in uh, greater participation, greater decentralization, strengthening of municipal finance systems, uh, more transparency, more accountability and rule of law and all of those different elements. Thank you so much, uh, Omar, uh, for flagging all of those different things and also for flagging that indeed the demands on local governments today are very different from the demands on them when we started uh, not two decades ago, three decades ago or more uh, working on this area. Uh, you know, they're not just looking at providing public services and we'll come to that conversation in, in a few minutes, but looking at addressing climate change, looking at socioeconomic recovery from the pandemic, looking at driving innovation, looking at attracting investment. We were not thinking of those things as central functions of local government 30 years ago. So fundamentally, the context has changed. And therefore, the 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 uh, conceptualization and the actions that you and Habitat must take with partners must change. So on that note, let's move to Latin America. Elkin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's probably still very early in the morning. Sorry, uh, but uh, let's hear your perspective on uh, urban governance and local governance in Latin America and the Caribbean. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, dear Shipra. It is indeed very early here in Mexico City where I am uh, at this moment. Um, I'm happy to share with you some of some thoughts about uh, uh, urban governance or the meaning of urban governance for Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm going to try to share my my screen. Share screen. I lost this. I lost. Ah, okay. Share I lost here it is. Okay. Share I lost here it is. Share so, I, I think the uh, as as the framework of uh, urban governance was uh, presented by Raf Tutz is very useful because it it also includes this um, uh, very important definition by UN Habitat that highlights key elements of the approach that I, I think are very relevant for urban governance at this very moment in Latin America and the Caribbean. It uh, uh, talks about uh, managing situations, public policies. It talks about uh, understanding that there is conflicts outside there and that we need to understand how to support the different interests and perspectives to be part of a solution, being optimist as you are proposing. Uh, it talks also about something that is not static. It has to be a process. It is dynamic. And I think this is a critical also to understand a new way to address urban governance issues. And uh, of course, it talks about the need to consider both formal and informal institutions and arrangements. And I think this is very important. And this is what I'm going to, to talk about. But of course, in a very concrete context, the Latin American one, uh, we are in a middle income region, but we do not have a middle class society very well consolidated. Uh, second, there is high levels of informality in different, different aspects of our life in, in cities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And third, which is, I think, critical at this very moment, more than one third of our population is uh, still young. And I think this is an asset that we still need to, to utilize. 
in addition to this, uh, we are still uh, going through a process of um, uh, social discontent, social unrest in different cities, in different countries, and that was before the pandemic, and that has continued during the pandemic. And of course, this is saying something about uh, how citizens are perceiving um, institutions, basically, about, about how citizens are perceiving the fulfillment of uh, the promises that uh, uh, democracy and democracy in Latin America and the Caribbean has uh, offered to them. I think this is uh, critical in, a, uh, in this moment of the pandemic. In addition to that, there are other dynamics, but uh, one that is really, really impacting very much uh, how we uh, discuss in cities in Latin America is the migration. I think this is uh, also a very important factor that we need to take into consideration when it comes to understanding Latin America and the Caribbean situation as of today. On governance, I would like to come to uh, this uh, governance analytical framework that is, is going to facilitate for me to put on the table some um, items, some ideas. This is the governance analytical framework that uh, uh, starts from uh, understanding that uh, governance is very dynamic that, uh, uh, sorry, because this is in Spanish. I have a second one, including in French, uh, because this is a global team's meeting. Um, uh, is, I, I was saying it, that um, the governance is something that has to be very dynamic and that has to be with uh, the uh, dynamic in time of a conflictivity or a problematic or a solution to a problem um, in a city or in a country or in a region. And it uh, comes with understanding some key points. One, that um, uh, stakeholders and actors, they uh, are critical and uh, formal and informal uh, stakeholders and actors are critical in taking part of the decisions. And I recall uh, the uh, coach the of, of uh, an Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian soccer football team saying that uh, he was very good in planning a match, but uh, the only problem was that uh, when the referee just uh, started the match, the players were moving around. And this is more or less the same situation that uh, uh, we have when it comes to urban governance. Uh, we can see uh, very nice pictures, static pictures of the situation in a given moment, but uh, every day actors and stakeholders might change their positions, might change their visibility, might change the way they interact in, in, in this process. And they interact in some spaces of uh, conflict or of uh, co-creation, and I will, will, I want to keep this very word co-creation. And of course, they are incentivated, motivated, uh, driven by some uh, règles du jeu, règles de juego, rules of the game, formal and informal. So, in our analytical framework, those are the three key perspectives that we need to look into when uh, it comes to try to support a city or to support a group of stakeholders to enter into a governance uh, process, urban, go urban governance process. And of course, uh, this is uh, easier to, to say than uh, to do because we, when we are working for an international organization like UN Habitat or for a national government, government or even for private sector as in a consultancy firm or in the academia, we like very much uh, some formulas and we like very much under simplifying reality and we like very much that uh, player, players are not going to move as before the match starts, but uh, this is not the reality. So based on that, some thoughts, uh, very telegraphic for Latin America and the Caribbean. One. Uh, Whatever the urban governance proposal for our cities needs to understand that we are in this very moment the biggest crisis in the last hundred years. Unfortunately, as you all know, uh, I am now in the region that is uh, being uh, hit, the, the, you know, the uh, or receiving the biggest negative impact of this pandemic, and uh, we need to understand that uh, this is going to take for uh, some years down the road to get out of this from the perspective of, of the social development, the social recovery, and from the perspective of the economic recovery. I'm not being pessimistic, I'm being realistic, and on the contrary, I think there is way and there is room to do things differently. We need to be aware that there is social unrest outside there, and that means that, that there is untrust, and we need to really uh, work very much on that. There is disconnect 
very often between what uh, institutions are, are proposing and what uh, uh, people outside there, particularly uh, youth, are perceiving or they want to receive uh, from institutions and leaders. This is very important. And as a um, uh, result, there is reduced trust in institutions. This is the context and this is where I think urban governance proposals from your habitat for from the UN and from other stakeholders are going to uh, I'm sure make a difference um, actors stakeholders and capacities I would like to refer to the relevance of uh, trying to understand better what are the capacities for not for the traditional staff, for analysis for integration and conversations with difference for data driven decisions for communications and building imaginaries that can engage, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a new fashion, uh, the communities and for negotiations. I think this last one is key negotiations. We are not in, in, a, uh, in, Latin, in, in our cities and, and towns in uh, that moment where we were just uh, waiting for the local government to rule and to say what to do. Now, there is a lot of negotiations because there is uh, people are empowered. People have data, not always the good data, as we all know, uh, but uh, they want to engage in uh, discussions, negotiations and uh, collective mm -hmm. constructions. Rules of the game, of course, revisiting the concept and what, what mm -hmm. can be adapted to these situations in terms of decentralization, in terms of uh, finances for local authorities, they are really receiving a, a very uh, tough or a very uh, hard um, impact out of this crisis. Subsidiarity, we need to review this and the, the ways for participation, not the participation, let me say, that we proposed to the world in Porto Alegre some years ago, the participation that we need today in this hyper-connected world uh, where we have access to every information, including the fake news. And then the arenas of exchange. I think this is one of the uh, areas where the UN can really play uh, a very important role with our convening power through facilitating structure, structured dialogues at all levels, the global level. We now see that the cities are claiming for having a seat in the discussion of the global problems and solutions, but uh, this is also true at the regional level and at the national level. And uh, we as UN, we can support very much the UN, the UN cities, the resident coordinators. Of course, we have a role to play to facilitate the inclusion of local authorities, local stakeholders in these conversations. Um, also in the arenas of uh, exchange among stakeholders, social networks. I do think that we still need to go to the next level in terms of understanding better how to deal with the exchange of ideas, um, the, the building of imaginaries in, uh, through the social networks. We know very well how to manage a uh, conference, uh, you know, the, the conference, the gatherings in our buildings in New York, in Nairobi and Vienna, uh, but uh, on the social networks, this is another level. I think there is a need in the world for a new epic and the Secretary General, I think, has been very, very vocal about that, promoting and uh, uh, guiding us towards proposing a new social contract. And I, dis I think this is it. But a new social contract also that can be built on SDGs. And I think this is wonderful because SDGs, as we all know, is something that is accepted uh, generally all over the, the world. I am wondering if what we need really to propose is saying that we go towards the urban governance of the SDGs. And of course, we are working on voluntary local country uh, reviews. We are working on localizing. But I think this can also give us uh, another perspective in a big bigger push in this point. My final comments are the followings. I think we need really, really to integrate the fact that uh, uh, reality is moving, is dynamics. Therefore, governance approaches, urban governance approaches and tools have to try to be adapted to this dynamic, adaptive governance approaches. This is what I, I think uh, we, we can still continue developing. It is very important also to understand, and this is not easy again, uh, treating different what is different. Uh, and this is our permanent dilemma. 
of course, we are very often being asked how many municipalities have you supported with uh, the urban governance approach of the urban planning approach. But then when it comes to every municipality, every local uh, place uh, is different and the entry point is different and the, this urban governance approach can be prepared to support the appropriate entry point. My mm -hmm. final comment is we need really to work much more uh, about uh, co-creation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, uh, is, is very much what uh, the world is needing, local authorities, local stakeholders are needing, and this is also valid for Latin America and the Caribbean. Those are the thoughts in a, in a very uh, 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 general manner that I wanted to share with uh, this important uh, meeting. Thank you, Dr. Shipra, for <laughs> the opportunity. You don't, you don't have to do it. I find I set a very bad trend. Thank you. Thank you, Elkin. Um, very much, uh, very much appreciate those thoughts. Um, first of all, that reminding us that urban governance is, is a dynamic phenomenon with many moving parts. Uh, second, that there are formal and informal rules of the game. Third, that it is the trust deficit that is absolutely fundamental that needs to be covered. And finally, uh, the importance of, you know, the ultimate aim is co-creation, co-creation of institutions, co-creation of policies, co-creation of solutions, uh, and, and co-creations of a common future. So thank you very much. Uh, that was great. And I think we are really moving with a lot of different ideas and, and reflections from, from our four regions. Last, but definitely not the least, can I invite Atsushi Kurosawa, the Regional Director for Asia and Pacific for UN Habitat, to share some reflections uh, from the Asia Pacific region. You have a large region and a diverse region, Atsushi, also at your, um, you know, in your work. So tell us a little bit about uh, your reflections, your thoughts on urban governance from, from Asia Pacific. The floor is yours. Thank you, Spray and colleagues. Uh, can I speak 10 minutes? <laughs> I know we are quite behind schedule. I try to be uh, as brief as possible. Please. Um, okay, uh, let me first uh, mention that, you know, uh, decentralization, delegation are also unfolding in this region. But uh, first and foremost, the uh, principle of subsidiarity should uh, prevail more widely and put in practice. And also, I'd like to mention, uh, this is just general reflection. Um, um, as uh, Arya speak, speak already touched upon, uh, delegation and decentralization, sh decentralization should be accompanied by uh, transfer of financial resources to avoid uh, increasing unfunded mandates, and especially uh, transfer of tax bases and uh, strengthening local taxi, tax system and also block grants instead of project by project, uh, you know, uh, grant. Having said that, uh, even after decentralization, uh, national policy and frameworks are important, which is central to uh, so-called uh, national urban policy. Therefore, uh, national urban policy should go hand in hand with uh, territorial governance or governance works rather than you know, being pursued uh, in isolation. That's a general remark. Let me uh, highlight some of the specific, uh, I mean, examples from our region. Uh, of course, I mean, territorial governance or institutional building have been uh, fundamental uh, to uh, sustainable urbanization uh, in, in our region. Uh, UN Habitat, uh, one, one example is uh, UN Habitat has been practicing the methodology of uh, so-called people's process, which uh, applies uh, people-centered and community-driven uh, approach to uh, disaster or conflict recovery, slum upgrading, and community resilience project, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's one uh, you know, concrete example, uh, you know, how we can uh, work with the communities, and that's an important uh, element of the governance. Second example is, uh, as already mentioned by um, Elfan and others, property tax is, uh, of course, major revenue at local level, and its collection system should be strengthened. And uh, we, we are implementing the project uh, named City for All in Afghanistan, which in which we surveyed all urban properties and to date uh, issued 830 uh, occupancy, 830,000 occupancy certificate, and also issued 720,000 
municipal service charge invoices and collected new revenues of 30 million US dollars. Uh, to address climate change, uh, you and we are uh, we have, are taking a multi-level governance approach. Uh, we have, for example, supported the integration of climate change into national urban policies in many countries in our region. And also we supported the development and implementation of local climate action plans at the city and community level, which eventually have informed national policies. Uh, next example is uh, uh, we are uh, you know, empowering. I mean, we are trying to empower mayors and which is a very, uh, it, which is a priority. And in our region, uh, UN Habitat is partnering with uh, other, uh, you know, um, partners like UNSCAP, UCLG, to implement a series of mayors' academy, which aims to provide uh, basic knowledge uh, to, to newly elected mayors, to basic knowledge about global agendas, such as, you know, new urban agenda and SDG and so on and so forth, potential partners, uh, into, uh, in, uh, in our region, also uh, chances for collaboration. So this is an uh, ongoing uh, effort with uh, many partners. Finally, let me briefly touch on urban and territorial planning in our region. Uh, in our region, we have been uh, supporting member states and cities for ex experience and knowledge sharing and mutual learning through the so spatial planning platform since 2018. Of course, the spatial planning is a typical example in which coordination requires between different levels of government and between municipalities for, of, for such things as a large scale infrastructure, uh, transport networks, airports, new urban development, waste disposal, and so on and so forth. So we will continue uh, this uh, support to, to member states and cities. And this is uh, become, I mean, we are recognized that you know uh, in our region uh, new plan planning governance frameworks with a strong focus on national long longer term environmental management consideration in are happening in many countries like China, Malaysia, Thailand, and Philippines. So these are some e concrete examples how we are uh, you know supporting uh, different levels of government in our region. So I have so far talked only a uh, few uh, examples, but we certainly have more uh, uh, examples or cases that you may you may want to look into. We would be happy to share. So thank you for for this chance and uh, this EGM is very useful. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Atsushi, for those very practical examples. I think that was very very valuable in terms of how governance. Uh, uh, interventions are helping to address key challenges uh, of the day in uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so that's that's very helpful. Colleagues, as Elkin told us, governance is a dynamic concept, and this EGM is also a little playing out in a little bit of a dynamic fashion. We are only thirty minutes, thirty five minutes behind time, but I promise we will catch up in the in the forthcoming dialogue. Um, uh, on uh, on the future of urban governance. After all, we need to adapt. So uh, without further ado, with, an, with a great thanks to Raf and Erfan, uh, Omar, Elkin, Atsushi, and of course, Rafa, uh, let's move to the next segment, which is the first dialogue session on the future of urban governance. Um, this session was should, was planned with two segments in mind one on public service delivery and one on localizing the SDGs. But fundamentally, these are two sides of the same coin. So I'd like to uh, take the moderator's privilege and merge these two segments and request our speakers uh, to speak, uh, our four speakers to speak in sequence with one, uh, one discussant and then open the floor for a conversation around both these elements uh, together. So let me start by inviting, and we have we have an excellent panel. Let me start by inviting UCLG. I don't know if Emilia Size is still online because we are late, and I know she had to leave at three. Um, but either Emilia or someone else from UCLG, uh, if they would like to take the floor at this point uh, to make an intervention to talk about reimagining the future of urban governance. 
uh, to reflect on some of the most important trends that you see as UCLG. Um, I don't, I see UCLG colleagues connected online. So perhaps while you confer colleagues and, and see who is to speak, let me move uh, to, uh, to Amy Gill from UNDP. Amy is, of course, in charge of uh, local governance at uh, UNDP, has been a long-standing friend and collaborator of UN Habitat. She's the team leader on core government, fun government functions and local governance in the Crisis Bureau at, um, at UNDP. Amy, of course, has long-standing experience in, in policy development and the design and management of local governance and recovery programs from all corners of the world. Amy, what is UNDP thinking on the future of urban governance? How can it drive sustainable development? How can it you know, transform uh, and, and accelerate the progress towards achievement of the SDGs? How can it strengthen SDG localization? Your thoughts on any or all of this? You have the floor. And about, um, about six, six minutes. Is that okay? Thanks, Shipra. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to talk about all of that from UNDP's perspective, I would take way longer than six minutes. But I'm going to <laughs> yes. touch on a couple of, of things. Um, and it's nice to be here with all of you uh, in this session. I'm going to start talking and try and share my screen at the same time, which could be tricky. But um, I wanted to touch on some of the elements that uh, the colleagues have, have spoken about. Um, I hope you can see this now. Um, and basically yes. look at uh, working with local governments and, and the, the system that has changed with um, with the pandemic, uh, which your colleagues mentioned before. So obviously within the urban environment, there's been a unique challenge with the pandemic, with 55% of the global population living in cities, but 90% of the cases from COVID-19. And then also sort of predictions that, and, and you spoke about before, constrained uh, financial environments, but they're going to be further constrained by the effects of the last year, or over a year now. Uh, there are figures in the US that suggest between 15 to 25% lower uh, local government finances in the next year, which will of course undermine public service delivery, infrastructure investments, and the sustainable urban development across the country. Um, and that's just from places that we can get figures. Obviously in a lot of the countries we work with, we don't have the privilege of having that baseline of data. Um, so we sort of feel that particularly this pandemic has been driven by the inequalities in basic services and has exposed the weakness in a lot of the deliveries of municipal public services. We um, so I'm just going to talk very basically about sort of three different areas. Obviously, there is the financial and human resource constraints, and these have been mentioned and these are important to look at. But I wanted to look at three different areas that we've also been considering when we're looking at, at how to work on local governance issues moving forward. One is very much on the service delivery and looking specifically at how services are delivered. And this is something that can be done. And one of the questions that you had put, Shipra, was what can we do in, in situations that have sort of great resource constraints? And how do we actually look at programming within these areas? So there's been research that's been done by the Secure Livelihoods Research Consortium, which is a 10 year longitudinal study. And for those that haven't seen it, I would very recommend going to their website that look specifically at different issues around legitimacy and local government. And one of the things that they have found is that in order to look at legitimacy, it's really important how the services are delivered and whether people have complaint mechanisms in order to actually say what they think, rather than just being involved in the decision making process, which is obviously something that we have also looked at a lot um, in our programming. So we believe that accountable institutional local government systems are building blocks that can not only help, but also foster social cohesion. And working specifically on this how, on the grievance management mechanisms, is one way that we can actually start to do that. We've supported this globally, but just as a couple of examples, for instance, in Ethiopia, we've started to work with the local governments in order to come up with different ways to allow people to actually say what they think about the services, which includes just very simple mechanisms of complaint lines on telephones, uh, complaint boxes, being able to come to the local government unit and actually be able to, to put forward what they want to say about what's going on. Um, we also have used it to try and establish sort of local platforms that bring together local government, private sector, 
um, other independent experts uh, and traditional leaders, which is something that we're doing in Yemen to really sort of have those discussions on how services are delivered. One of the other things I wanted to quickly highlight was on social service, social safety networks. So social safety nets are not a cheap, easy thing to do in a resource constraint environment. But if you take the figures that ILO has put forward and the World Bank has put forward, which looks at how much would be needed in order to set up a social safety network globally, Estimates suggest that 1.6% of GDP would be needed in middle income countries and about 5% of GDP would be needed in low income countries. This is on average less than either of those categories of countries spend on health services or education services or indeed on the majority of services, excluding things like um, waste collection. So while it seems like a heavy lift to actually talk about social safety networks, if we're actually talking about public service delivery and trying to set up preventative systems, this should be a conversation that we're having within the governance sphere and we'll be having with local governments. More and more people are relying on casual uh, labor, um, they're relying on self-employment uh, and remittances. And we know this and we've tracked this. So it would it really behoves us to start moving the conversation with the, the governments that we work with to understand this dynamic on whether if they're able to set up social safety networks, what it would actually save in the future. Um, the last point I wanted to talk about, and it's been mentioned before, the access to information, and it is a very tricky one because it's the pandemic has shown us the importance of people being able to get information very quickly of being able to understand what the different rules are that the government's putting forward, of having that communicated to them clearly. Um, but it's also obviously a prerequisite of not only coordination, but also delivery. And we work in a lot of places where there is not a lot of data. And there's been a lot of push moving forward on looking at, at new sources of data and digital data, which I think is important. But also one of the things I wanted to raise here is actually the access to information and the transparency. We've always sort of thought that um, access to information is, is an important part of, of what the population need to understand in order to understand uh, what they can actually access, where they can find information, where they can find services and what they actually need. But many commentators and academic papers caution that access to information doesn't necessarily lead to greater participation or state accountability or state responsiveness. So this sort of assumption that we have underlying within this is is not necessarily true. Um, and that what we should be looking at is the real structural and political barriers that have hindered the capacity of the governments to actually deliver this and the incentives of the government themselves to actually produce this information. We push a lot on transparency, but again, this may not be the most useful thing we can do unless the political will is actually there. And political will, as we know, doesn't cost that much. So if we're talking about resource constraints, it's something that where it exists, we really have to sort of understand and look at our political economy analysis and then be able to move forward and actually action on, on these in these particular areas where it would open up and allow people to actually understand and have access to information. Um, understanding the, the political incentives of the, the different institutions that we work with is really important, but it also would allow us to actually to, to take forward programming that will make a lot of difference uh, with um, with minimal finances. So in a recent survey, the Global Resilient Cities Network found that 68% of municipal government respondents want idea sharing platforms and want transparency from COVID-19 recovery planning, which, if we're going to suppose, leads us to believe that 68% of the respondents would be interested and have the political will to take something forward. So I think it would be really good for us to cap capitalize on that moving forward. Anyway, I just want to thank you all for uh, allowing, asking me to be part of this. Um, and I'm afraid I have to go as well to another commitment, but I really look forward to continuing to work with you and Habitat as we take these all forward. Thank you, Shipra. Thank you, Amy. And yes, I know you had to leave and thank you for staying on uh, despite our uh, and, and being part of this session despite our delays. Your point about 
uh, access to information not being in a direct correlation, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, participation or accountability or improved uh, service delivery is a very important one, both in terms of data sources and in terms of how that information is shared. But what information is shared? Elkin raised the point previously about fake news, about all kinds of information going out there. So sometimes it actually undermines uh, what you know what what we're trying to do here so very 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 important points thank you very much and the issue about political will how can we forget uh, you know that's absolutely fundamental doesn't cost anything uh, so thanks very much and we look forward to continuing our collaboration Amy I'll let you go um, we move on now to uh, Ms. Rosa Pavanelli uh, she's the General Secretary of Public Services International, uh, which unites more than 700 trade unions representing 30 million working men and women who deliver public services in over 150 countries. Uh, I came across uh, Rosa when we were co-conspirators in uh, the preparation of the new urban agenda, and since then have had a lot of respect for the work that PSI does uh, and, and their members do all over the world. So Rosa, thank you so much for joining us today and, and your perspectives mm -hmm. on some of these questions around delivery of public services, around governance being, uh, you know, being uh, being central to that process uh, and, and what Amy was also addressing. How do you deliver public services? How do you keep public services public in uh, resource constrained environments when there's a lot of push towards engaging with the private sector or outright privatization sometimes? Um, how do we how do we do this in different corners of the world? The floor is yours. Six minutes, seven minutes. Thank you very much, Shipra, and thank you very much for inviting uh, PSI to this uh, discussion, which is really crucial uh, while we are starting uh, the recovery and reprojecting the future of our communities. I think that uh, whatever we want to do for the future has to be looked at uh, through the lens of the pandemic and the experience that we have done. And from my perspective, I have to say that uh, the evidence is that uh, more and more we see that uh, climate and health crisis are strictly intimately connected. Uh, and we need to address those two issues together in a comprehensive way. The second thing is that we saw that the global economy, as it was shaped during decades of decentralization of the industrial production, failed. Long supply chain, chains are the responsible of the unpreparedness that many, if not all, uh, governments and local government, national and local find them, found themselves uh, at uh, the outbreak of the pandemics being unable to provide personal equipment to staff, ventilator to patients, enough uh, medication. So uh, we need to, to look at this process and fix that and think that we need to shorten supply chains and governments at all levels had to rethink their industrial fabric in order to be able to respond to the need of their population and their local environment. Uh, third thing, we saw that all the realities, either at national or at the local level, I just want to mention two examples to be clear. Uh, one positive, New Zealand, who invested very much in public health system, in staffing health uh, uh, services, performed much better than all those countries who have been cutting uh, funding to the public health system, uh, cutting staff, uh, and privatizing the services. This, the opposite is, for instance, what happened in Madrid, where a strong privatization of the health system made harder and harder to respond to the pandemic uh, compared to other cities in uh, Spain as well. 
So this is for me a clear message that we need to uh, address these issues investing in public services. And it's not just about health. We saw the importance of education. We saw the importance of water and sanitation in so many places to keep our community healthy and safe. Uh, it's transport, it's social housing. How can we think uh, to have a confinement if people has no possibility to a decent housing? And uh, this means also uh, creating the conditions for a sustainable economic development, which is based on the well-being of our communities and not just on the profit made by corporates. I want to be clear, and maybe I disagree on some of the things I heard today. I think that those who are responsible of the crisis we are we have been through cannot be the solution. And all sort of PPPs, uh, mixed finance, creative, innovative financing is not the response because this is part of the problems we had. And if even the president of the United States is questioning the Washington consensus, asking for a global tax on corporates. This is the time to address the issue of financing, local development, and you know, uh, building a fairer society through the introduction of a tax on wealth and through the introduction of a tax on corporates that we as a, a trade union ask for a minimum of global 25 percent but okay 21 as proposed by the u.s president would be enough and would provide a lot of money that would be enough to address the issue of the social protection globally and also provide the resources uh, to uh, address uh, uh, the idea of a different form of development. I want to mention another thing that is referred to, uh, to governance. We saw that uh, 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 conflicts uh, often driven by uh, partisan political different orientations uh, uh, between central government and local government has been one of the reasons that has exacerbated the capacity to respond to the emergency. I think that we need to consider that there are issues such as public health where centralization is important, but the response cannot be devolution to local government without providing the resources and the means that are needed to respond to the population. Because at the very end, local government are those who have to face the needs of people and who have to respond in person to the needs of people. This is something that has to be fixed and has to be fixed in a, in a, with the idea that government at all level has to take more responsibility. I personally disagree with this idea of this multi-stakeholderism that is spreading within the UN and the global system. I think that social partners, workers, business, trade unions, have to be part of the solution, but the responsibility, the major responsibility, has to remain in the hands of democratic institutions that we all contribute to elect and to make effective through our democratic participation without capturing the government, as it happened, unfortunately, in the past with the uh, um, uh, the corporate power penetrating the economy and the, the political system at all level. That's all. That's not all. My God, uh, Rosa, as as expected, that is not all. Those are some absolutely fundamental points. Uh, talking about uh, the the idea of multi stakeholderism somehow becoming a reason for national governments to abdicate their responsibilities. 
national governments that are elected, uh, are duly elected and national governments that are funded by our taxes, as, as, as uh, we should not forget. Absolutely fundamental. Devolution, uh, not without uh, the accompanying fiscal means not saying that, OK, local governments have to find creative ways of raising resources themselves. I think that that conversation certainly needs to be balanced out. So some very, very important thoughts there um, as um, as we move forward. Thank you so much. And as someone already wrote in the chat, well said, uh, we will take all of those elements, uh, uh, you know, and, and integrate them into our conversations going forward, I hope. So thank you very much. And it's great to see you again, uh, Rosa. Let's let me now move to um, uh, as a, a, a different perspective again, let me invite um, uh, Tony Pippa, Anthony Pippa, who is with the Brookings uh, Institute. Uh, Tony is, is a senior fellow at the Center of uh, Sustainable Development, which is housed at the at the uh, Global Economy and Development Program at, at Brookings. He's, of course, uh, been studying place-based policies for a long time, also involved in reflections on the future of U.S. multilateral aid, um, both looking at uh, the United States within as well as the world outside from uh, from uh, a very from a very reflective uh, lens. So, uh, Tony, the floor is yours. I would like you to reflect a little bit about this whole agenda around public services, but also a little bit more about this idea of localization. I know Brookings has been supporting a lot of initiatives around localization, voluntary local reviews, uh, empowerment of local governments to deliver on Agenda 2030. So some thoughts on those dimensions as well. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shipra. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, all of my remarks are coming from our work on localization of the SDGs. We we manage a small but strong network of cities from across the globe called the SDG Leadership Cities Network, cities that really are in the vanguard of localizing the SDGs and trying to harness their power as sort of the blueprint for their local progress. And uh, it's a unique network in this landscape of city networks, um, a lot of trust and innovation uh, amongst this particular group. So. I want to talk a little bit about how localizing the SDGs and the leadership of local leaders and mayors um, provide a platform for the future of urban governance. And first, you know, as we've been talking here, the one thing I think it's just important to reemphasize is that the leadership of local leaders and mayors matters. And COVID-19 has certainly shown how important that is. Um, with local leaders at the front lines of managing the impact of the crisis. And they're now in the leadership role of shaping a recovery that's inclusive. So a recovery that works for all, that leaves no one behind, and also takes action on climate change and accelerates the transition from carbon to a new economy. Um, and those that have committed to adopt the SDGs for their local progress are positioned to make this recovery aligned to the SDGs concrete and tangible. We often find that with uh, at the national level, it feels a little bit abstract, but local leaders are you know, providing concrete solutions for real people in real neighborhoods. Um, at the same time, uh, I think the crisis has exposed the extent to which those local leaders haven't been granted the autonomy or the resources necessary for them to directly lead the response that's in uh, that's uh, in line with their aspirations of the SDGs. And it's also highlighted in some countries how vulnerable they are even to attacks or to pressures from other levels of government or the national government. Um, we just heard about the importance of providing public services, yet local leaders are often struggling to put the resources together to ensure the necessary level of those services to accomplish the health security and the social protection and the action on climate change that are really going to be necessary for a sustainable uh, and healthy municipality. So I think that leads to the second point, which is the extent of the crisis shows that, you know, local leaders can't do this alone. And it's localizing the SDGs provides them a platform for local governance uh, and a collective voice um, and even a platform for partnerships uh, that can enable them to achieve these aspirations. 
So in this context, you have mayors seeking solutions to strengthen their collective voice and legitimacy regarding their central role on the SDGs. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about how local leaders are aligning their city strategies to the SDGs. And as you mentioned, Shipper, they're undertaking voluntary local reviews as a way to document their progress on the SDGs within their cities and municipalities. Now, voluntary local reviews are an innovation. They're something that cities uh, and municipalities have been doing because it's valuable to them. It enables them to uh, put coherently all the different things, all the different dimensions of development that they're working on. But then it also puts their issues and aspirations in the common language of the SDGs, and it provides them a way to develop their collective voice and influence in political fora and venues to maximize their opportunities for collective political action. And I think it enables them a, a way to benefit from the support of other mayors and city networks. And this common language then gives local leaders a platform for informing the development planning of national governments and the voluntary national reviews that are being presented at the UN. And it enables them an, a, an opportunity to advocate for the resources and the attention and the policy interventions that they need at the local level to achieve the goals that the SDGs are really to be made real. So it becomes this political tool for engaging national stakeholders uh, and, uh, and their local leadership in the national conversation. Um, and I, I know we just heard about multi-stakeholderism, but it also provides a platform for multi-stakeholder governance. Um, and this is really important because not everything is within the, the managerial control just of the political leaders and the political jurisdictions at the local level. You really are going to need aligned contributions from the business community, from civil society, from the university community, and from international organizations and the UN organizations that can help support this. And being in the common language of the SDGs and making a commitment, a local commitment to it, really, and, and institutionalizing that agenda really provides a, a platform for partnerships, uh, and also for just acceptance and alignment of contributions of, of the different sectors that can come together to be able to make progress on the SDGs. And then I think the final point is that a local commitment on the SDGs provides a platform to continue to affirm the legitimacy of local leadership, of local political leadership, and build trust between local governments and its constituents. So the SDGs require this focus on data and evidence. That's the basis for the voluntary local reviews that we were just talking about uh, to transparently measure progress towards their targets. And the, the focus on data and common indicators can really help align action. Um, and, uh, and it also provides a platform for local innovation, actually, some of which can be exported nationally. Countries should be considering how local leadership uh, and local innovations which are shaping progress on the SDGs should be applied at the national level. Um, and the SDGs also are increasingly providing a platform to include citizens in the urban governance process. You have e-participation that increases citizen engagement and promotes transparency and accountability of public services. Things like participatory budgeting platforms in places like Madrid are enabling citizens to decide directly on how to distribute part of the municipal budget. In Mexico City and Paris, the legislation allocates a percentage of public resources to participatory budgeting. Um, we've also had cities in our platform uh, using participatory planning and focus groups aligned with the SDGs as a way to elicit uh, a common uh, agreement and legitimacy around that lo larger issue. So for cities to remain successful, they're going to have to maintain that public support and the trust for their agenda and a local commitment to the SDGs, you know, provides this political tool to accomplish the green and just recovery that we need from COVID-19, uh, both with their constituents, uh, with their national governments and with multiple local stakeholders. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tony. I think very, very important points and very important reflections on this entire conversation around localization, what it means, what it entails, what it needs. 
uh, to succeed uh, and and what it can bring really to cities, uh, but also to national governments equally, and that's absolutely fundamental. None of this is is local uh, is about local governments alone. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, we have a short intervention, um, maybe three minutes uh, from our discussant, Anel Duplessis, uh, who is a professor of law and acting director of research at the Northwest University um, with, with her scholarship focusing on the nexus area of environment, local government and different aspects of human rights law and city governance. Anel, what are you hearing? And uh, can you offer us some reflections on what you've just heard? Three minutes. And I don't see you or hear you. No? No. OK, I think we're having real challenges, some real challenges with Teams also today. Even Microsoft has put it out in, in the world there that we have a problem with Teams. So perhaps she's dropped off. Let's open the floor. And if Anel rejoins us, uh, she she can um, she can join the conversation. Let's open the floor for about 15 minutes of a discussion around what we have heard today around issues of, of public services, around issues of local governance, urban governance. Um, the dynamism of the process, the fundamentals, the importance of focusing and structuring our conversations around SDGs, the importance of, of multi-stakeholder engagement, but not giving into multi-stakeholderism. Uh, that was very interesting. The importance of localization, but not local focus, but not with the local focus uh, alone. The, uh, the challenges in different corners of the world, the four regions, as we've also already heard in the opening. I open the floor for your thoughts, reflections, questions, um, and, uh, and ideas for the way forward. Um, if you can keep your interventions short, I will keep an eye, raise your hand, because there's too many participants for me to follow uh, just on the, on the screen. So if you can kindly raise your hand, your, your electronic hand, that would be very helpful. The floor is open. Any reflections on what we've heard? Or even just recommendations or ideas for you and Habitat to take forward um, on this entire question of what should we be focusing on? Shipra, I cannot find how to raise my hand, but if I can have it's the okay. floor for jump, two minutes. Jump right, in, <laughs> jump right in, Maria, jump right in. So hello, everyone, and thank you very much. It's very good to, to be with all of you, and it would have been much better if we were all in the same room, but let's not complain. So um, those who know me know what's coming, because I am the usually the one who talks about the elephant in the room. And in this case, I want to talk about legislation. So I have the feeling that we cannot be discussing the future of governance without talking about legislation. So legislation and rules of different kinds and forms are the glue that brings governance together and the different systems of governance and the different layers of governance. And what has been happening so far is that it's always the last thing to come into the discussion. And it's the, the most convenient scapegoat if something um, doesn't work. Well, it's legislation that is uh, the reason for that. So I believe that we need to to move in a um, in a different direction where legislation is one of the issues that we tackle together with all the other ones that we address when we formulate our policies, when we design our plans about uh, different levels of, of uh, and different systems of governance. Um, I mean, the new urban agenda relies on national legislation and national policies for its implementation. So we need to make sure that all of these are fit for purpose, that they can actually deliver what they're there to deliver. And 
as we all know from experience, this is not something that will happen magically. And it will not just happen because we want it to happen. We need to um, we need to, to make an effort in that um, direction. And I'm not saying we should leave everything else and focus just on legislation, but while working on all other aspects of, of governance, which are really and truly very important, I think this should also be one uh, aspect that we seriously look at and we look at it early on, not at the end and definitely not um, ad hoc. And during the last, we've been working at the University of London together with the legislation unit of Buren Habitat for the last over seven, eight years. And we have built a comprehensive knowledge base of you know what works what doesn't work with different kind of rules in diff different systems of governance and urban governance so i think we already have the knowledge and the expertise that can be brought into this uh, discussion to prevent failures that might cause failures of the broader um, systems so yes um I, i'm 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 also looking at the rules of the game mentioned by elkin co-creation and trust and also the the prospect of not leaving anyone behind and all of these are also processes that um, can be uh, used when producing legislation and can produce better quality of legislation and can also have an important impact in not just delivering better results but also in making sure that no one is left behind in practice so just that from me and thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Very, very important. And I think this point was also raised a little bit before. How do you make sure legislation is enabling and not constraining and not shackling, in fact, uh, action by you know local governments, uh, actions by stakeholders, making sure they have the requisite resources, making sure that uh, you know any devolution and any decentralization is accompanied by all of that needs to is accompanied by adequate resources. All of that needs to be framed within the legislative uh, you know framework. So absolutely agree. Thank you for for flagging that. Uh, for us today, and of course, we 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 absolutely need to work on it a lot more. Thank you. Um, other colleagues, if you'd like to jump in, uh, both um, from within a habitat, outside habitat, any reflections? Uh, if you can't raise your hand, then you're very welcome to to open your microphone at this point and and jump into the discussion. There is, um, Maria, there's a question for you on accessing the database and the Institute's findings on, on legislation, what you talked about, uh, what works, what doesn't. So perhaps you could put in, uh, put in uh, a link to the study you were referring to um, in, uh, in the chat. That would be very helpful. Uh, OK, I see two hands. Great. I'm very pleased. OK, I will go with our with our guest first. So Esteban, you have uh, the floor, followed by Lucia, our colleague from your Habitat. Esteban Morales. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening to our colleagues and it raises quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of questions. And uh, I'm well. I've been I've been I've been trying to apply to my own knowledge and experience all that has been said, and to compare with uh, what uh, reality sometimes brings. And especially uh, the, the last uh, speaker, Maria, um, has put on the table that legislation should precede. Uh, uh, the response to governance challenges. Now, in, in Latin America, maybe elsewhere in the world, there's a tendency to over legislate, to legislate everything and to think that reality changes just by signing a law, uh, which of course is not true. Uh, so, um, well, personally, I've always struggled with uh, trying to correlate public policy with legislation, uh, to, to design first a public policy and then to legislate on that public policy to have, uh, to have clear, um, uh, clear goals and to have clear institutional mechanisms to put the, the policy in place. 
Now that doesn't often occur like that, no. Uh, um, pol uh, legislation is a very politic uh, phenomenon, and politicians like to be in the picture and show off, and you know, uh, and that takes to uh, sometimes even precipitation. I would say in signing uh, acts into law. Uh, so. I think basically the question is how, how do we manage to convince politicians that it is important to first design the policy uh, and then uh, legislate and then put it into practice and, and make it become uh, an issue already of, of governance and participation and partnerships and etc. All that has been uh, talked about today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esteban. Uh I, I do I do think you're absolutely right that this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem uh, in different parts of the world. Does policy come first or legislation uh, come first and which one comes first and which one follows? But I do have concern when we say that, you know, first you have policy, then you have legislation, then you have practice, then you bring in all the participation bit. Uh, I, I have a bit of a challenge in accepting that participation comes at the end of the value chain rather than throughout the process of designing policy legislation and, and fundamentally, therefore, uh, the governance is the process that makes us design good policies, good legislation and makes us implement them better. So a little bit of food for thought uh, there as well, but thanks. Um, Lucia, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Shipra. I couldn't agree with you more that we need participation to be throughout the process, not coming at the end. Now, on this issue of uh, legislation and, and, and governance policy, which comes first and which comes last, I think it is high time to consider engaging and bringing some parliamentarians into this conversation. Parliamentarians and parliamentary uh, associations. In a sense that, like Maria has put it, legislation, you cannot separate legislation from governance or governance from legislation. So that being the case, then, uh, you know, let us engage and bring on board in these conversations with those that are at the center of, of this. But uh, that said, I'm not so familiar with all the participants in this. If you, you we have some parliamentarians or parliamentary associations, then you have to forgive me. But we need parliamentarians in this. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Lucia. Also to flag from the from the engagement of stakeholders point of view, uh, parliamentarians are indeed an important stakeholder, important constituency that we don't engage enough with. So thanks very much for flagging that. And also thanks very much for taking it forward as the lead on stakeholder engagement in Habitat. Uh, let's move to Evandro. Um, you have the floor. Short intervention, please. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Shipra. And sorry about the background noise. I'm in a street right now. Enjoying yeah. you know, the only sunny days in Berlin. Now, I just wanted to to comment. Uh, I think moving a little bit away from from the legislation uh, discussion, just uh, try to think that uh, I think sometimes we do focus a lot, of course, based on, on our mandate, on how to work within a specific city or within the the urban environment itself, which is already a challenge by itself and already challenge enough for the years to come. But I was wondering, for example, in the context of COVID especially, uh, what kind of additional challenges it, it brings in, in opportunities, because uh, we've seen in some, some countries, and I mean, I, I come from Brazil and I can, can say it very clearly that, for example, the, the inaction of uh, national or sometimes even regional, regional government allowed the city to work sometimes by itself and trying to implement some measures, some structures of governance. But at the same time, it can, it can be sort of a challenge in how different cities can actually work together. And as I said, I mean, we do have quite a few mechanisms and instruments. We've been doing a lot of work uh, from the city administration 
downward sometimes, but uh, maybe uh, also taking this as an opportunity to reinforce, for example, the connection and the linkage between the cities and how they can cooperate on, on a regional level. So those are the two points that I want to, to bring up. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much uh, for those. Um, OK, I see that we have um, just about five minutes, five, six minutes left. So any further thoughts before we try um, to summarize a little bit some of this um, some of this conversation and the action points, the key uh, takeaways from um, from this discussion. Any um, any further reflections? Rafa, Rafa go ahead, go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Chipra. No, I just want to make uh, maybe an invitation, if I may, uh, because I heard something that I like it a lot, which is the, the word process. I really think that we need to start understanding governance as a process and not as a mean uh, or as a, I mean, as a mean and not as a goal by itself. Uh, so uh, governance has to become uh, in, the, in, in a good way uh, uh, to do things to, in a good way to legislate, in a good way to implement public policies, in a good way to overcoming all the different uh, uh, urbanization challenges that we heard today. Uh, so my invitation is to, to start to understanding a governance really like a process, more like a, like a final goal, and try to 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 include uh, and to to unpacking that process and, and that work. Uh, so thank you and over to you. Absolutely, absolutely. We've always uh, struggled with this uh, with this idea that governance is an outcome and governance is good governance is an outcome and good governance is a process and good governance is an underpinning of everything we do. So absolutely. Rosa. Just uh, um, to mention that uh, talking about keeping public public services, uh, it's time maybe to consider to remunicipalize uh, public services that has been pri have been privatized uh, over the years. We now have about 1,500 examples that have been studied uh, uh, across 56 countries of public services in the health, in local government, water, uh, telecommunication, transport uh, that have been remunicipalized. And this is uh, something that we need to consider because they always bring more more savings than outsourcing or privatizing services. And another thing, talking about uh, uh, participation of stakeholders uh, in the governance, uh, I do agree with that, but we need rules uh, to make the participation of all the stakeholders equal, democratic and equal and not uh, pushed by vested interest or uh, um, other sort of uh, uh, representativeness uh, that is not responding uh, to the real democracy we want to build. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very important points there. And, and indeed, the conversation around remunicipalization of services is, is absolutely uh, picking up now, especially as we have seen uh, in the pandemic, after the pandemic, uh, you know, where where public services have have remained public and have been invested in have probably been more effective. So kind of an important conversation and the participation of all stakeholders. Absolutely. David Simon, you have the floor. Thanks, Shipra. Um, some great presentations and, and diagrams, and I think we've actually covered the terrain very well in through that combination of uh, what we've already heard. But several people have mentioned um, a series of phrases or terms that are closely related, transparency, accountability, uh, political will. And I think you, slightly tongue in cheek, Shipra, in summarizing at one point said, after all, political will doesn't cost anything. Well, actually, it can be one of the most expensive components in the game. 
Um, and that's why it's always left, as it were, um, almost as the basket. Well, of course, it all comes down at the heart of governance to political will. But I think if we actually spend a bit of time disaggregating and thinking a little bit more carefully about what political will means in different contexts, we might actually unlock some of these blockages. In some cases, particularly in uh, responsive, accountable democratic systems, um, in all their diversity, it refers to the pressure that politicians feel from one or more constituencies to act or conversely not to act or to prioritize particular agendas. And obviously there's room for action and we can work out uh, how different stakeholder groups might do that and, and indeed they do that anyway. In other cases, it may be a, uh, a situation of, well, we'd like to do that, but we lack resources in which case there's another subset of issues and how one might relieve those constraints or change the prioritization in the context of climate change, sustainability, post-pandemic recovery, so that the understanding of what is required no longer seems to require the same level of resources as previously thought, particularly if we have coherent uh, multiple objectives that lead to multiple um, achievements down the line rather than having a sort of silo approach. But the real conundrum is in situations where the system is not accountable, not transparent, not democratic. And the question then is, when all the usual levers and pressure points do not work, how do we effect change? And ultimately, it's a challenge not just to us in, in, in this virtual room, but even to the whole UN system. I mean, it's always a problem being seen to intervene in the affairs of a, a member state or indeed constituents of it. And so we land up with these euphemisms. But you know, how can we find a way to get beyond the euphemisms and, and call out uh, the unwillingness, the inability to respond? So if we think about it in those more disaggregated ways, we, we might make some progress. Thanks. Thank you. How do we call out the unwillingness to engage and the unwillingness to act? Uh, gosh, you're really putting us on the spot here as the as the UN. Uh, you know, are, are we really going to be able to do this? <laughs> this is the challenge. This is the challenge to us indeed. Um, how do we do this? We are at the end of of this segment. So let me let me just try and reflect and put a, bit, a few, perhaps a few action points. Thank you all for those for those very, very important points. Also, please um, do note uh, there's a very lively conversation going on in the chat. Uh, as always, some of the some of the most interesting points are also made in in the in the sidebar in the chat. So don't forget to to follow that. But um, but very quickly in terms of uh, a bit of reflection and and a bit of uh, a few action points that are coming out of this of this conversation. First of all, of course, uh, the the importance um, of urban governance, the importance of uh, good urban governance, which is which is uh, qualified still by through those universal principles that UNDP, UN Habitat, and others crafted several uh, several decades ago, uh, with a few others, is the 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 uh, importance of urban governance in. Um, in achieving peace, in achieving climate resilience, in achieving uh, in achieving uh, equality and fairness and justice, spatial as well as social as well as economic, is absolutely uh, un unquestioned. The importance of the role of local governments is also unquestioned in these uh, in these um, in these uh, difficult times, regardless of their constraints. I think we need to look at UN Habitat's approach and tools. This was raised right early on. We have 30 years of experience in this in this space. We need to look at the tools. We need to look at the approaches. We need to look at how the context has changed and how these tools can be adapted to new challenges and emerging needs, whether it is um, you know, a range of our, our tools around local to local dialogues, around transparency, around participatory uh, budgeting, et cetera. So I think those are those are uh, that's I think one thing that we need to do. The second, uh, 
Governance is a dynamic process. Realities keep changing. The goalposts keep shifting. Actors keep doing what they're supposed to do, and they're not static. And how do you, uh, how do you create a model? Somebody mentioned a model. How do you create a model of a dynamic process? How do you support local governments? How do you support local stakeholders in in understanding and engaging in urban governance processes that are dynamic and the pieces are are constantly um, shifting? The question of trust, I think that came up, uh, a trust deficit, the question of keeping, you know, um, uh, the questions of transparency, access to data, but also sourcing of data. All of that um, came up quite strongly. Um, not working on any assumptions, not assuming, not equating that access to information is going to lead to participation, but really uh, something Amy said about pulling down real political barriers and something that that again um, uh, David Simon just raised about really looking at uh, political will and uh, and taking you know, taking it head on very 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 important. Um, then other questions around uh, looking at um, you know um, looking at. Um, uh, devolution or decentralization not as any kind of a silver bullet. It doesn't work unless it is accompanied by the requisite resources, the requisite tools, but also devolution does not mean an abdication of responsibility uh, of the national government. It doesn't mean that local governments and local stakeholders are suddenly responsible for the entire uh, spectrum of functions um, and and uh, and services that need to be delivered for a sustainable future. No, it's really a question about um, about how um, the different levels of government and the different stakeholders engage in order to deliver these collective um, uh, aspirations. And of course, finally, the questions around um, public services, the very important points made around pub the need for public services to remain public governments to remain as lead implementers of policies and measures and and all other actors to be part of uh, the solution. But the responsibility still needs to rest uh, with with uh, national governments uh, to to a great extent. Um, a lot of those a lot of food for thought, and I think this takes us directly into the next segment around multi-level governance. I think we've provided my colleague Philippe de Court, who's going to be moderating that session with enough starting points uh, to open the conversation and take it further. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. This has been a most enriching discussion and um, really look forward to uh, to staying in, in this discussion for the next two days and finding the right course of action, the right partners, uh, to take the UN, to take UN Habitat's governance work and governance agenda forward. So thank you again, and uh, I guess over to Philippe. Thank you, Shifra, uh, and thanks. Uh, it looks like you had a, an interesting discussion. I was involved in parallel governance, having to attend. <laughs> a couple of other meetings so uh, I will count on you exactly to make sure that in the next segment uh, we do build on what was said uh, so far. Uh, I won't assume uh, but counting on you to to help us with that. Um, and I think as if I understood exactly Shifra's final points correctly, uh, there is always an appeal to make sure that we revisit urban governance and make sure it's fit for purpose for our current context. Uh, when it comes to multi-level governance, I, I think that's where the debate is probably evolving uh, the most, uh, and where maybe we need to we need to rethink uh, even more uh, what we are doing and why we are doing it. Uh, I'm involved. I've been involved in, in the COVID response for Inhabitat. I'm overseeing uh, the program development branch for Inhabitat. So I kind of see how our strategic plan and our work is moving, uh, and I see this this notion of multi-level governance is really coming to the fore very strongly. Uh, and so I, I really look forward to to the debate here um, because I think it's, I want to hear your thoughts on how you how you see this. Uh, we worked on the uh, Secretary General's policy brief on, uh, on COVID-19 in an urban world. Very strong language on yes, local governments are in the front line, uh, they're the front line responders. But ultimately, of course, the economic recovery policies are being set 
by, by national governments. Uh, the fiscal uh, measures are being taken by, by national governments, although local governments see their, their resource base being, uh, being reduced. Uh, the strategies are being set out at the national level. So how do we make sure that at, at the right level, the right things are happening? And it's not only about enabling local governments to do their role, but also making sure that local that national governments take a responsibility in doing what they need to do at their level. Uh, and if you look back at the new urban agenda, this issue, I think one of the main premises of the new urban agenda actually was saying that urbanization is a responsibility of national governments as much as cities have a role to play and local governments have a role to play. National governments have an increasingly important role to play. We've engaged a lot, as you know, at the national urban policies. Uh, but clearly it's still there a lot to be said about what it means when it comes to financing, when it comes to planning and how exactly that, that alignment then can happen uh, with the different levels of government and it's different for context to context. So I'll, I'll leave my opening kind of introductory comments at that level. It's the same, of course, for climate. So maybe one final note. It is important when we talk about COVID response. It's extremely important when we look at climate uh, and this importance of making sure that also, and this is an additional point, there's a big push in making sure that the urban dimension of national determined contributions, the NDCs, is incorporated, meaning that national local governments actually are contributing to the del commitments and delivery that national governments are signing up to when it comes to global agreements. So even there, it's the opposite. It's, it's local governments helping national governments to deliver on their agendas, and the same goes for the, for the SDGs. Um, we have a couple of interesting speakers with us. Uh, allow me to juggle my, my different files uh, and kind of uh, see where we start. Um, I think we have two segments. Uh, zooming in a little bit more on the role of subnational governments within that multi-governance perspective. Uh, and then we'll focus a bit more on policy coherence and effectiveness between the different levels. Um, I won't ask for a very strict separation between the segments and I will call upon the speakers in the first part also to engage actively in the debate on the second part. And of course, for all of you to make sure we connect the dots across uh, what is being put forward by uh, the speakers in terms of provoking further uh, discussion. For the first segment, uh, we have two speakers, uh, if I'm correct, uh, Octavio de la Varga, Secretary General of the World Association of the Mayor Metro Metropolis, uh, and Evi Marais, uh, Sustainable Development Officer for Regions 4. Um, then in the second segment, uh, we'll get to policy coherence with uh, Mr. Bokyun Shim, Head of the United Nations Project Office on Governance in, uh, in UNDESA. And I believe we have some additional remarks also in that second segment, and I'll pick up the name in, uh, in a minute. Um, allow me not to uh, spend too much time uh, further from my side and basically uh, ask uh, Octavio de la Varga to help us uh, introduce this subject with his presentation. Um, seven minutes, uh, please, if you can, and then we can, uh, we can uh, move to the second speaker following which we can have a, a brief discussion on the two uh, subjects together. Go ahead, um, Mr. Octavio de la Varga, are you online? And I'm assuming yeah. also if you have a presentation that is managed. Uh, I'll post uh, a bit of your background in the chat rather than going it through myself. I'll, I'll put some brief bio elements in the chat for everyone to see. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon from, from Barcelona. It's been really interesting, the previous discussions, and many of them, I mean, they need to be connected with the discussion of, of, of multi-level governance. And in fact, well, this is a discussion that we've been having for a while on what's multi-level governance, uh, looking at the positive aspects. And, and even now we have created new, new approaches to governance, which in some countries is talking about, about the spheres of governance instead of, of, of levels of governance, or about the, the, the collaborative governance and cooperative governance. The fact is that at least what we have seen and around in our membership and what's happening in different countries is that, uh, the pandemic, I mean, has not introduced new new problems. Uh, it has confronted to the paradox of our urban development processes, and that's related as well to the paradox of the urban governance. Uh, but uh, what has done is accelerated some of the processes and has confronted us to this 
to the to the, the, the contradictions that we, we already had. And in terms of, of governance, uh, on the one hand, I mean the, the, the clear example of these contradictions has been at the at the metropolitan level. We have realized that the metropolitan perspective in many cases has not been taken into account, has not been taken into account in the discussions on, on multi-level governance. In fact, we always say in metropolis that the metropolitan factor or the metropolitan areas are the disruptive actor, actor in local governance and regional governance because sometimes they overlap with different, uh, at an administrative level, they overlap uh, with, with different authorities working in that territory. I just can quote uh, an example of what happened in, in my city, in Barcelona, during the pandemic. The, the decisions were transferred, some of the decisions, some of the measures were transferred from the national government, the central government, to regional governments. And the regional government decided to uh, uh, establish uh, certain lockdowns at municipal level and then at county level. In the context of the metro, metro area of Barcelona, the reality was that in some areas of the metro area, I mean, citizens don't distinguish between which is the border of one municipality and the border of another municipality. They, they live across the street, one municipality to another municipality. Or even you had the underground moving across three municipalities within the metro area of Barcelona. Uh, it was a clear example that the metro, metropolitan reality was not taken into account. Uh, and it's been, in many places, has been the discussion incorporating the metro actors has been avoided. The problem as, as well is that well, we have not, uh, we've been using in the last years, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not from, I'm not, I'm not bringing here an academic approach more on the, on what we've seen and we have noticed from, from our membership, is that we are witnessing in terms of, of, of metro spaces, metro areas, uh, a continuous change and a change which is always very, very, very quickly goes, happens very quickly. And we have the feeling that the, what's, uh, the decisions in terms of institutionality, frameworks, legal frameworks, uh, solutions are always running behind the reality, the metropolitan reality. And once you have established agreements, you have established institutions, you have established elements of coordination with the different levels of, of administrations, the metropolitan reality has completely changed. Uh, and it becomes kind of a bit old. And this is something we, we don't know how to sort it out. And it needs to be taken into account when we are, we are, we are developing this process and we are establishing these frameworks of multi-level governance. Uh, and maybe it should be related to what has been said before, thinking governance as a process and not something that is set and defined with, uh, that cannot be changed, that needs to be adapted in terms of, of, of the territorial, um, in terms of territory, but as well in terms of institutions and in terms of actors that are going to need to be to be involved. And this is something that should be uh, incorporated in the debate, in the, the current debate, and as well in how we want to approach metropolitan governance in the future. We see as well that metropolitan governance should not be only thing of, of metro areas. It's metropolitan governance. Uh, in fact, what we say in metropolis that we call for the metropolitan governance approach, which means that all the different actors of the territory, all the different actors of a given region, all the different actors of, of a state should take into account this metropolitan governance when they are def defining the urban governance systems and, uh, and, and, and defining the, the territories. Otherwise, the, the, we will be missing, we'll be missing a, a point, and is when these this metro areas become a kind of disruptive actors, as I said before. Uh, some of the pillars of this of this this governance that, that we think it should be incorporated. And I think some of them has been said in a different way in, in previous interventions is uh, I think, and you also were mentioned, it was mentioned before, is the political, political will and vision. Without political will and vision of the territory and political will, nothing happens. And of course then, of course you need then, you need the, the frameworks, legal frameworks, institutions. But sometimes I have the feeling that we, uh, we run more, we, we have the pressure to develop the structures the legal systems, the models, and the frameworks, but we have not had the discussions, and the, and and there is not the political will to reach agreements, to cooperate, to work together towards the vision of the territory. And, and and I think for me that's that's critical. And of course, then you need the resources, you need human resources, financial resources, and then of course the part, the other part is how you feed citizen, how you feed citizens in all this system of multi-level governance, and, and how they take part. It's not only about participation, but about the involvement, the engagement of citizens in all these processes. And, and last, I think we something that's going to 
which is changing as well this dynamic and should be incorporated in the debate of the multi-level governance. Some of the critical challenges that cities and metro areas in particular, they are facing uh, that should be incorporated in this multi-level uh, governance debate. One is uh, urban growth. It's not going, there was this debate if urban growth was going to be stopped in some areas of the world because of the pandemic. This debate about people moving to medium-sized cities, moving to the rural areas. But what we see is that in some regions of the world, urban growth would continue happening and there would be issues about housing, mobility, waste management, uh, inequalities, which is not only the business of one given government, but of different layers of governments. Um, the second one is the issue of resilience, but not only in terms of climate resilience, but as well in terms of social and economic resilience. The third one is the issue of the digital disruption, how it's affecting our societies, how it's affecting the way we, we manage and we govern our cities, our metro areas, how we relate local governments and different layers of administration that relate to citizens, how governments are, are, are working and providing services. And the fourth one, which is also related to the previous, is the public legitimacy, something that has also has been said before. The transformations that, has, that are taking place in the way the political, the policies are being made in, made in, in, in different local governments, the, 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 the direction that we are no longer working in silos, it's introducing transformations in the way the policy making is being done at local level, but as well, it should introduce transformations in the way that all the layers of governments are interacting between, between them. I should stop here and then we'll continue later on with the debate. Uh, thanks a lot, Octavio, for making very efficient use of your time. Uh, and I, I just reflecting exactly on the challenges you were highlighting, of course, are, are very relevant on the, at the urban level, but of course, at the metropolitan level, this becomes much more complex. Uh, I do want to kind of, uh, and again, uh, I'm flagging a few issues. Feel free in the chat to highlight uh, others. Uh, this old problem of the disconnect between administrative boundaries and territorial realities. Uh, that's there. Uh, it's becoming very acute again, of course, with a crisis like the pandemic uh, and dealing with climate uh, and dealing with inequalities. Uh, I know that in the Statistical Commission, for instance, at the UN level, we are looking at the functional definition of urban areas, because even when we talk about the SDGs, talk about the urban dimensions has been challenging because, of course, we didn't really know what urban was. And it's not, of course, the administrative boundaries were not a good tool to do so. Just to say that on the statistical side, progress has been made and then to see exactly how we can reflect it also on the side of governance to make sure building on the metropolitan experience, uh, we take it forward. And it's not just limited to metropolitan areas, but also, of course, due to other, uh, other situations. Uh, mentioning of governance as a process, uh, an important uh, aspect, uh, finding reasons to cooperate and, and starting maybe with that. And that's also what I started with. What are the reasons to really cooperate? And of course, the pandemic was a very good example, uh, but also recovery going forward uh, stays uh, stays on top of the agenda. Allow me to move uh, to the second speaker first, and I do encourage you to highlight other things you thought uh, were important in uh, in this first presentation, so we kind of keep track of the issues you you really want us to to keep in mind as we uh, continue. Um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ivy Morales, uh, Sustainable Development Officer in Regions Four, and I'll ask exactly my colleagues again to post uh, the bio in uh, in the chat. Ivy, good to see you, uh, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Philip. And I also would like to ask uh, to thank you and Hatta for the invitation, for giving Regions for the opportunity to contribute to discussion on the EGM. Let me share my screen with you. Um, sorry, it's just not finding my presentation. Um, just one second, I'm sorry, finding some problems, browse here, upload one, I'm so sorry. Well, I will start just saying that I'm especially happy um, why, why I'm finding my presentation here, I'm sorry, um, to, um, to see the UN had to organizing a session on multi-level governance and the role of subnational governments, um, because I think that in the past year, we have seen progress in the way the UN system is acknowledging the, lab, the relevance of subnational governments. Um, but, um, and, and we also have provided, um, well, we, I, I mean, local and regional governments provide a political will and capacity to organize and contribute to localized development agendas. Uh, we must recognize the increase in voluntary local reviews, as we heard in the, in, earlier this morning, amended participation of local and regional um, 
uh, in national delegations, for instance. Um, we even recently saw the creation of the UN Task Force uh, on the future of cities. Um, and I think that this is clearly advancing the long, um, the long pledge of the constituency uh, for a seat at the table, right? Um, and much more, I think, that is still to be done. Uh, so the national governments, they want to be recognized as a sphere of government, uh, distinct from the non-government organizations. And I think that this uh, recognition must include both cities and regional governments as well. Uh, well, I think that this, I finally got to uh, put my presentation. Can you just confirm if you can see it, please? Yes, you can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so well, and this, in this, I think that it is in this precisely the scenario um, that we are seeing that a multi-level governance plays an essential role uh, in addressing development challenges. Um, and the key is how the interaction among this level of government is processed. As everyone said earlier, too, this is a, ma a matter of process. So how the competing interests, the priorities, the influences result uh, in a coherent policy making. So it's not about competition, um, but it's more about the partnership um, and co-responsibility, right? Um, it's not, um, sorry, just not working all the enters that it should. OK, here, yeah, now I, I manage. <laughs> so regions uh, are one of the political spaces in which cities and urban sisters are embedded. So they are responsible for territories characterized by a constant interplay of urban, rural and urban factors and where they can guarantee a sustainable interdependence while also promoting context specific uh, policies. So regions are pivotal to the promotion of sustainable development and the enhancement of territorial cohesion. So a well-designed multi-level governance framework is critical to ensuring that the decentralization process has these better development policy outcomes and could even minimize the inefficiencies, the inequality, these duplications, and the silo approaches that everyone is complaining and <laughs> with reason are complaining that we've seen in our territories. So the challenge is more how to move from this theory, from this concept that we have of multi-level governance to the action, how to meaningful realize in the existing normative and institutional frameworks and to create this multi-level cooperation culture. So I believe um, that uh, overlooking the role of regional governments is a missed opportunity. And, and also it's important to know that there is no multi-level governance without the coordination between all levels of government. So we must include all of them from regional governments and also metropolitan um, uh, authorities, as Octavio was saying. Um, and uh, so I think that it's important to highlight uh, the key opportunities that if regional governments are properly included. Uh, first, um, I would say that a, a perspective from regional governments is needed to question their artificial rural-urban divide and to understand the urban areas as deeply interdependent with their surrounding, surrounding territories. So the new urban agenda they, it recognizes uh, that the urbanization process does not end at urban boundaries. Cities depend on a territorial system in terms of food security, on transport, infrastructures, waste, water management, and so on. And in addition, regions cannot readdress these imbalances between cities, even being then large, medium, or small, um, and also villages and rural world. So regions there are striving to compensate the differences in the territories by evenly distributing the opportunities and assets. Second, uh, I think that regions can foster the creation of institutional frameworks for the articulation of local governments and can also be a vital complement to the central government's development policies. So regions are in a privileged position to coordinate and lead the action of lower tiers of government that sometimes do not have the capacities or even the abilities. Um, and here, uh, allow me to give one example um, of the Basque region, uh, which supports the Udal Sarea 2030 platform, for instance, that offers guidance and assistance to municipalities implement in the SDG policies. Um, I also want to stress that a region's capacities to translate the national indicators and develop monitor frameworks should be taken into account. Many regional governments have their own statistics, uh, statistics institutes, uh, offering experience, offering capacity, and even resources to collect and analyze the territory disaggregated data. So this can play an important role in establishing um, open and re reusable standards for cities, offering also comparability that sometimes is, is not there, and also transparency. Um, third, 
Um, I think that our regional governments are a game changer in mood level action and climate environmental challenges. Uh, and I could share many examples guided by Regions Adapt Initiative, uh, including the case, for instance, of Jalisco, which follows the Mexico's NDC at the same time that it has strengthened the adaptive, adapt, adaptive capacity of at least 50% of the most vulnerable municipalities and achieved a zero deforestation rate. So, and we can also uh, recall the experience that we uh, heard uh, earlier today, shared by Atsushi Kodesawa uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, in, in the same topic of disaster risk uh, management and building resilience. Uh, it's also important to know that some countries are elevating their national commitments based upon actions driven by initiatives taken at the state or regional level. And California and Flanders are well-known examples of that. Um, fourth, and my fourth is not appearing here, okay. Fourth, regional governments are not only the intermediate implementer of national policies or the nexus um, between national and local policies, but I think that regional governments are part of the construction of global policies. So they are bringing knowledge, they are bringing experience, they are bringing innovations, and also lessons learned to the international arena. My organization, Regions 4, uh, is constantly assessing good practices on multi-level governance from our member regions, and they are available at the Knowledge Hub in our website, and also in publications such as these three reports on SDGs, climate adaptation, and biodiversity, just to give an example of what, of what regions are doing right now. And with this notion um, of integrated and balanced in territory development that I think that I share uh, with the metropolitan authorities, um, as well as the not to be missed opportunity that regional governments can bring, uh, I really hope that urban governance takes the territory seriously into consideration. And even HAPTA is um, the focal point for local and regional governments within the UN system. And I think that it should strengthen the role of regional governments, incorporating them in its narrative, uh, at least to begin, and also offering improved opportunities to assess the agency's projects and also amplify their voice within the UN process and international forum. Um, I think that it's important to continue promoting acute traffic cooperation across administrative and territorial boundaries. It's also crucial that the that that promotes um, balanced representation between local and regional governments and actually all levels of government in the, in the global events that they are organizing. Um, also fostering increased peer-to-peer -peer learning among regions, particularly the ones from the global south and those that are not engaged yet in the international scenario. And I think that UN had this plan to adapt tools, methodologies, uh, identify best practices, provide technical cooperation, partnerships, advocacy, well, et cetera, uh, should be tailor cut to regional governments, their responsibilities and competences. I hope that the UN had to provide knowledge and guidelines, for instance, on the specific contribution uh, of the regions and their voluntary subnational reviews. Um, borrowing what Elkin Velasco said earlier today, uh, we really need to treat different uh, what is different, right? Um, and my last point, I think that I, I hope the agents can promote capacity building to national governments uh, to understand the need for engagement all level of governments for early stage in the decision making process, because consultation is not enough for us and their the expertise should be sought uh, through formal and informal structures. Uh, as we've heard also today, political will is still one of the main uh, drivers of this change. Um, well, I'm really looking forward to seeing this move from the theory to action. And I can also say that Regions 4 and its members, we are committed and willing to contribute to New Hats' effort and also to exchange our experiences and good practice. So, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Ivy, and also thanks again for respecting the, the time uh, and for providing your inputs. Um, I, I understand there's only one speaker left, so I, I would ask uh, him already to prepare uh, to be uh, to take the floor next, so we can combine the three presentations and then have a, a broader discussion going forward. Uh, maybe exactly uh, what I, Ivy, what I found interesting, of course, your your clearly saying, look, uh, the territorial lens uh, requires us to look at the urban rural linkages, um, which requires uh, regional governments to come in. Uh, the question would be, uh, how do we define the regions? Do we really can look at, at cohesive territorial entities uh, or uh, are the current, uh, is the current setup adequate? So I also would like to hear us to, to make sure we, we think a little bit out of the box in this EGM 
in terms of where maybe critical shifts are necessary to make sure that we are uh, effective in terms of the reasons for collaboration. I think you, you clearly pointed out some of the roles you see for regional governments, but also said, look, if we want to move from theory to action, uh, that's where we need to be clear what needs to be done. And, and that dialogue you were calling for between different levels of government and, and culture of cooperation are two elements, but maybe also we can get to a little bit more uh, tools and mechanisms that can help us to uh, to get there. So what is missing to actually uh, create a culture of dialogue to uh, to have that um, culture of cooperation is to have that dialogue to really become effective in dealing with some of the urgent issues and again bring it back to you added biodiversity to the mix uh, the the conflict between urban growth and biodiversity which I think is highly relevant. We have very clear reasons to collaborate much better uh, but what are the tools to uh, to do so? Uh, of course one of the elements is clearly defining roles and responsibilities. Um, moving on uh, if you allow me exactly, um, bear with us, uh, because speakers have been uh, really respective of time. So I think we add the third speaker and then we, we can open a more broader discussion. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Bok Yun Shim, uh, Head of Office of the United Nations Project Office of Governance in UNDESA. The floor is yours and we'll add the bio to, uh, to the chat also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you. It is my great pleasure uh, to, to be joining this very important expert group meeting on governance to speak on policy coherence and effectiveness uh, global to local. This uh, slide uh, uh, provides a quick overview on my presentation online. Uh, this uh, slide underscores how policy coherence is central to the 2030 agenda. The seven uh, SDG 17 with a particular focus on target 17.4 calls for enhanced policy coherence for sustainable development. Enhanced policy coherence is an explicit target for SDG implementation. Uh, policy coherence uh, uh, four is uh, very key to uh, achieving sustainable development. It has an uh, objective to help. Uh, first, uh, uh, synergies uh, across policy areas, uh, identify uh, trade-offs and reconcile domestic policy objectives with the international agreed objectives and address spillovers of domestic policies. Uh, it is important to note that the policy coherence goes beyond the nation-state and addresses various levels. Coherence is across levels of governance can be categorized into four groups, uh, uh, national to international. Uh, the uh, national to international quadrant also encompasses the south-south uh, policy interlinkages. What is important to hear is that the SDGs are aligned uh, with the development policies. International to international, uh, uh, it refers to coherence between international policies at the global level. National to national points to coherence across the levels of government within a country. Finally, uh, uh, the international to national, uh, it refers to the actions taken by a government to adapt to, a, uh, to international dynamic scenarios as through its own policies, acknowledging the agency of governments to adapt to international conditions. Uh, next, in addition, these five levels, this figure shows vertical coherence across multiple levels of governance, uh, from local to global, and the horizontal coherence across the sectors, across, uh, sect, uh, actors, uh, uh, including um, in governments, private sector, and civil society. Next, this diagram highlights the building blocks for effective policy coherence. The diagram shows eight building blocks, which include political commitment, uh, integration, uh, long-term planning, uh, something like that. And then uh, I will now proceed to reiterate how institutions matter to policy coherence. Even though institutions mean a multi-dimensional concept, it involves a range of structures, entities, frameworks and the norms that help manage society. Institutions are dispensably important uh, because they impact how policymakers conceive problems, 
shapes decision-making processes, uh, influences resource allocation, and shapes the level of societal uh, engagement. Next. Uh, even though uh, horizontal coordination is very vital for uh, policy coherence, major obstacles tend to hinder the process of realizing uh, effective interministerial coordination. Many ministries and institutions tend to work in silos due to diverging priorities, goals, and preferences. Another major barrier to interministerial coordination is a situation where ministries tend to protect the area of responsibility from the interference of others as they compete for political attention and skills uh, resources. Likewise, ad another uh, serious problem arises when information is unevenly distributed and not widely shared, uh, sometimes even hoarded among government institutions. Uh, vertical policy coherence implies linking different levels of governance from local to international as well as institutions across different levels of social organization. Also, there is an important linkage between national, some national levels for SDG implementation. A number of challenges exist. There is disparity between SDGs and the local initiatives uh, and the policies. Uh, uh, most local governments have a limited knowledge of SDGs. Uh, there are sometimes marked differences in the organizational culture uh, between national and local governments. Uh, most lo uh, go local governments are faced with the challenges of poor coordination mechanism uh, with noticeable fragmentation of jurisdiction and mandates. A great number of local governments uh, lack the needed resources in finance, data, and skilled human capacities. Uh, next, in addition to the challenges just explained in the previous slide, this result shows the challenges in implementing SDGs at the local and regional uh, level from 2020 OECD survey report. The lack of awareness is up uh, support uh, capacities or trained steps, including difficulties in price tires, and the uh, SDGs and insufficient uh, financial resources were identified as the top three challenges. Uh, these tools are recommended for ensuring effective vertical policy coherence for SDG implementation. Uh, there are leadership uh, laws and regulations, uh, planning, implementation, and monitoring. Next. Uh, while significant gaps exist at the multi-level governance stage, it is important to propose measures to uh, overcome them. Seven gaps uh, have been identified. Uh, consists of uh, information gap, capacity gap, uh, something like that. Uh, on the right-hand column, you see the actions needed to close and address these gaps. All these mechanisms help overcome fragmentation or lack of coordination across levels of government. Uh, it will uh, be a great step in uh, if we overcome the, these gaps uh, in uh, guaranteeing participative, balanced decision-making in a multi-level governance process. It is uh, imperative to emphasize that stakeholder engagement is at the core of accelerating progress on achieving the 2030 agenda. For instance, SDG 16.7 and 17.16 all call for promoting inclusion, participation, partnership, and multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, stakeholder engagement is considered a prerequisite for policy coherence based on reasons uh, such as working across sector boundaries for co policy coherence requires engagement with relevant stakeholders to contribute multiple perspectives. Engaging stakeholders helps to better understand the policy linkages synergies, build consensus, and promote ownership, get access to relevant data, and raise awareness on promoting the SDGs, among others. Stakeholder engagement is at the center of the SDG principle of leaving no one behind. Uh, various levels of stakeholder engagement exist. The levels of engagement uh, ranges from the lowest of informing uh, 
to the highest in, uh, on empowering, as shown in this slide. This slide provides uh, uh, a concise checklist for organizing an effective stakeholder engagement, the framework of planning and assessing equality management engagement ranges from purposeful engagement, inclusive, transformative, and finally, proactive engagement. This is crucial for promoting participatory decision-making in the multi-governance context. In conclusion, beyond the existing traditional institutional measures, achieving collective action, coordinated integrated results will require the following data-centric approach, promoting the use of e-participation, building innovative and multi-scale stakeholder partnerships, leveraging digital technologies for citizen engagement. Uh, these measures are proposed based on the challenges to the vertical in, uh, integration previously identified on uh, the slides, uh, the previous slides. Uh, uh, thank you all very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Can you leave this slide up for a second exactly? Uh, if you can leave your presentation up with the last, last slide. Is that possible? To have your last slides uh, visible again. Um, and I think thanks for thanks for your uh, yes thank you thanks for your presentation and I think uh, what we also hear across the tree is that we have a lot of old problems uh, the silo thinking of course becomes quite acute when we're trying to achieve policy coherence which is very hard to do when the culture is not there the capacity is not there the institutions are not fit for purpose uh, and so it's interesting to see this list on where you believe uh, we can start making a difference to shift those old systemic problems into a more collaborative culture uh, that requires uh, possibly innovative financing mechanisms, transparency on data and sharing. Uh, so I think that's uh, some interesting points for, for discussion because uh, I will open the floor now uh, and I really would like to hear from, um, from you uh, online on where exactly uh, we need to take this uh, this work on multi-level governance. What would actually make a difference? How do we get from theory to action uh, around some of these critical issues that we are dealing with, be it the COVID recovery, the climate agenda, the biodiversity? Where uh, What would actually be the best entry point that ultimately will result in the biggest uh, difference? So the floor is open. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or highlight in the chat that you would like to take the floor. And definitely would like to hear from people exactly with uh, with real experience uh, out there working at different levels of uh, of government. But evidently, all of you are welcome to uh, to contribute. Hi, Philip. Rafael here. Yes, Rafael. Please go ahead. Yes, I think there is an interesting common insight from the three speakers. And it is that the role of regional and metropolitan government, uh, governments should to be strengthened. So I, I would like to, to invite the, the other experts participating in, on thinking how. Uh, what, what are the different possible ways to strengthen this role of regional and metropolitan governments? I can think in, in a couple of ways, for instance, uh, through, through fiscal and political decentralization from national to subnational levels, uh, and also uh, improving vertical coordination between different levels of government and horizontal coordination between different local governments and also different sectorial uh, institutions. But I, I would like to, to also hear more ideas on the other participants. Thank you and over to you. Thanks, Rafael. The floor is open, but I would like to challenge you and others to uh, to really kind of help us indicate what will make the difference. Uh, because uh, improving vertical coordination, uh, strength of regional governments clearly is important, but what will actually be the entry point to shift the needle and making this happen? Uh, the floor is open. May I add something on, on the was uh, Rafa was was saying? Uh, yes, it's true that we, 
Can yeah, you introduce, I think briefly introduce your name. Just give your name and then. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Octavia. That's Octavi again. No, just, just reacting to what Rafa said, and it's true that we keep on all of us telling more coordination, more coordination, and creating spaces for coordinating. And uh, but the reality is that this is not happening. I mean, the issue of of, of the power struggles within territory, with between levels of administration, is just all the time there. And and that's something we need to be realistic and take into account how overcome these power fights. And the other thing I think one approach is. Uh, we should start as well thinking in terms of urban systems and, and territories uh, with a territorial approach that will help as well then all the different administrations working in a given territory to work toward the same territorial strategy. That could be uh, a starting point as well. Thanks, Octavina. And I do think exactly you said, look, making sure that the territorial lens also drives coherence at the national level, I think is an interesting uh, an interesting thought uh, and identifying what will actually improve coordination. And I think that's why, I, Mr. Shim, I, I liked your list because uh, the importance of, of just transparency on data and information is one. And just looking at the end of your list, uh, maybe coming up with, with financing mechanisms that force people to come together in allocations of budgets at different levels of government is also an interesting thought. So uh, the floor is open, Ivy. Your floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I think that I cannot agree more uh, with Octavi saying that, uh, yeah, the coordinated dialogues are not happening. So if the UN system could support in promoting structured dialogues would be, you know, the first step. I think that the first step is bring these regional voices and the metropolitan voices at this table, not only the UN level table always, but maybe even inside the different UN agencies, in expert group meetings and so on. So I think that having this kind of tailored uh, cut, as I said, uh, approaches is important because sometimes we are mixing and we have many differences of types, like typologies and regions, and it provoked me asking what, how to, how do we define regions? At least for us, we define regions at the, the first intermediate level uh, after national government, but we know that there are diversity and sizes and so on um, of regions in the world, but there are also diverse cities and local governments in the world, and this is not a constraint to have to work with them. Thankfully, right? So I think that we just need more work um, on these levels of government. Um, and also bringing uh, a little bit of what uh, you said also before about the, this new role and these new modalities and uh, these new challenges that we are facing with climate, with resilience. We also need to see this mainstream across the UN system, right? Because uh, we are, of course, now here discussing over governance, but discuss multi-level governance and the role of these, uh, these actors is also discussing how they are implemented in, 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 in your UNEP, in UNEP, for instance, or in other agencies, because climate is is a topic, for instance, uh, addressed by different uh, agents in the UN system. So having, I think that everyone uh, together is the, really the first step. And also these would, uh, this, this exchange of practices and so really, really encourage others to see that there are results uh, that are being developed, there are, there are steps that are being moving forward and not only the very same of the old ones uh, speaking all the time or topics that really do not concern them. So I think that original governments are not participating because they're not seeing that their opinion are taken into account. And this is kind of harsh to say, <laughs> and, but, but it is what I have received as a feedback from our members, that they really want to be there, they really want to be present on this international uh, arena, but they also want to talk with peers with, about matters that really affect them, uh, that it sometimes are different from matters than of cities. No, thanks, Ivy. And I'll definitely invite uh, others, colleagues, to, to come in on, on, on your particular points uh, on regional governments. I'm looking at the chat, uh, and uh, I wonder if Mr. Edman wanted to come in also and clarifying. Uh, he said, look, we, you were talking about dialogue, Ivy. Uh, it should result in something. And political commitments, kind of contracting between different levels of government and what they all committed to do each from their own side is one tool, but I assume, Mr. Edmund, there is also kind of a financing mechanisms uh, connected to that. Mr. Edmund, could you, are you in a position to clarify your uh, your uh, input into the chat? Yes, thank you. So, Albert Edmund from Viable Cities in Sweden. Um, I have a chance to speak about it tomorrow at the session tomorrow as well about the, the climate city contracting work that we are piloting now in a number of Swedish cities. 
uh, also connected to the European Union mission on 100 climate neutral cities by 2030. Uh, and the setup that we've tried to implement is to connect the political commitments at local, regional and national level, uh, which is there uh, with a number of Swedish cities and regions and the national government, but also to connect that to the financial framework that is available at national level uh, and of course, the, like it was mentioned before, the horizontal coordination that happens naturally at local level, um, where you can connect with business interests, uh, civil society interests, citizen engagement, etc., and also municipal investments. Um, but these have been differentiated before, so there's not been any opportunities to take make use of co-benefits that exist between these different levels of government. Uh, you will have costs allocated to local governments that generate income at regional government level, etc. So that is the ambition of this climate city contracting approach that we're trying. Um, it's piloted in nine cities, will be 20 by the end of this year. And the theory is, um, which we'll hope to put into practice, is that we nobody knows how we can change similar to the mission approach of the Apollo mission in the 1960s in the US, but to, be, to, to agree on a mission politically and then to let business, citizen involvement, etc. come with the solutions um, and to revise the contract on an annual basis. So it's actually a contracting approach that will be jointly developed and developed as and on an annual basis because the contract as they stand right now in Sweden are not strong enough but we also identify jointly the shortcomings that we have. So that is the input. And I'll, I'll share some more in, input on that tomorrow afternoon. No, thanks, uh, Albert. And I think it's relevant for this discussion because exactly you, you talk about uh, introducing some new one, some new uh, uh, ways of describing the issues, talking about co-benefits, which is new language if you want to talk about multi-level governance but and, all, and contracting but also kind of making sure that the political commitments and those agreements actually tie into financing, uh, which is probably one of the critical challenge that if we get that right or we get new practices there, we can shift the way multi-level governance works. Uh, the floor remains uh, open. Simon, I see you have some, some comments on this. If you want to, uh, if you want to exactly for the sake of this discussion, multi-level governance, expand on it. Um, in this group, happy to do so. If you want to leave it to the chat, uh, that's also okay. Sure, thanks, Philippe. Uh, just very briefly, um, I was thinking more generally in response to the the presentations um, that we're all talking, writing, researching about collaborative multi-level governance as either an aspiration that is achievable or indeed something perhaps that already exists. Uh, so I simply picked up on on Albert Edmonds. A uh, great example of viable cities, which I happen to know about, but of course the Swedish situation is unusually collaborative and 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 so on, and sadly um, all too rare in international terms, where the reality in many cases um, is that different political parties or alliances control uh, different parts of central, regional, local government, not always the same ones, and therefore. Um, when you put that together with with political calculations and rivalries and the the often lack of clarity in various ways that I've detailed in the chat um, about the divisions of powers, responsibilities and resourcing across the three levels or tiers of government, uh, mm. you, you have an unhelpful recipe, shall we say. And that really is, is one of the key challenges if we're going to achieve what we all um, hope for in response to climate change, broader sustainable development challenges, post-pandemic recovery and resilience or, or you know, a combination of them. It's how we actually break through. It's back to the sort of political will question we talked about in the previous session. Um, these are some of the, the real difficulties. Uh, we, we use these euphemisms, we have these kind of nice expressions to encapsulate what we aspire to, but actually how we achieve them in different political contexts is the nub of the issue as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. No, I, I, evidently, and I think uh, Jaydeep is, is reinforcing uh, some of your points you, you just made. Um, I think that said also, it makes me think ultimately if that those political 
uh, rivalries exist uh, and they're very real in a lot of contexts. Uh, how do you break through them? Uh, and I would argue that that often the right kind of crisis and the right kind of urgency gets us there. And so we are talking about the COVID-19 recovery. We are talking about the climate emergency. So I would love to hear some thoughts on how that is driving, actually breaking through some of those old barriers uh, and old uh, tension, fraction, uh, fraction lines, and actually generating new ways of working. So we did a lot of live learning in the last months, last year, around the role of local and regional governments. And it would maybe good to hear if that's opening up new doors uh, that could take us forward. Um, the floor is uh, continues to be open for anyone that wants to contribute to this. Uh, and again, maybe anyone with a concrete experience uh, that has seen a shift in their own context in their own region uh, maybe dealing with uh, COVID-19 or the climate emergency. Of course, Sweden is, is a, a very specific example, so it would be good maybe to hear uh, another one. I see hands up. I'm not sure if they're old or new, Octavi and, uh, and Ivy. Yeah, I, I can give what Once is that I think the, the addition to this equation is that in this uh, structured dialogues or coordination with the different tiers of, of, of government, we should incorporate the different actors as well as the territory, as civil society organizations, private sector, acad academic, because then, I mean, you will you will force uh, that the agreement will last, because it will be not only a, uh, seen as a partisan approaches or political approaches, and, and in, in the discussion in the chat that we're saying that sometimes this coordination happens because there is this political power uh, fight, powers, because there are different parties in the different layer, layers of government, but, uh, for example, we in Barcelona have launched an initiative of consultation with the different actors, not only with the different uh, political actors and layers of government, but as well with different actors of the territory. And we have the feeling that this is strengthening the multi-level governance because the, the pact and the agreement uh, has like witnesses and other actors who are interested of the lasting of, of, of for all, all these agreements to last in the in the time. No, I think that's that's a very valid point, Octavi. I think I uh, appreciate uh, putting it out there, which is, reflects also the Swedish uh, the Swedish example that 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 buy-in or that that cooperation is not just to make multi-level governance work is making sure some of the other key stakeholders are part of that discussion and, as you said, witness uh, to uh, two agreements that are needed and pushing for them. Uh, and, and again. Uh, climate emergency is certainly one where there's, there's a lot of pressure in a lot of context to get to those kind of uh, agreements. Uh, if, if anyone wants to pick up on a different point of the presentations uh, made so far uh, and, and add an, another layer to the discussion, uh, more than uh, more than welcome. If I may, Philip, I think that uh, in addition to this advisory sustainable development councils, for instance, that I, I I pop in up here and there that I think that are bringing not only different levels uh, of government, but also multiple stakeholders for the implementation of the SDGs, for instance. Um, I think that there are some interesting examples, and I can recall uh, in tying also to the discussion that we had in the first session today uh, of the rule of legislation. Um, the, the government of Wales, for instance, uh, developed the well-being of future generations and it was embedded in the legislation. So it was approved by the parliament, it was approved by the, the ministers have responsibilities, the whole government have this responsibilities, and also um, in, in precisely in different levels of government of implementing this agenda. So this is a long term, um, a long term strategy. And in, this is also uh, one point that I think that these voluntary subnational reviews uh, are also contributing uh, to say, well, it's not only the initiative of this party or this political group, but it's also a, po a question of policy and governance, uh, government and more than, than only one state, right? It's implementing a specific uh, and short term vision. Another point that is also very important um, that it, others are, uh, have raised it too uh, is apart from this vertical integration, uh, what can we do for the horizontal integration? So what we can do um, promoting like the ministries or the different departments are talking with each other and having this coherent uh, approach because this is also one of the comp competing priorities within the governments are also very uh, common 
And uh, some, so I think that, it, you know, just to add another layer to our already complex discussion, right? No, thanks for that, Ivan. And, and I want to do, uh, I mean, I, I've asked uh, to keep the last slide up, and of course, uh, the points were made in the previous presentations remain equally valid. But I think uh, one thing that can drive uh, also shift is, is this data point on in the beginning here. Uh, because and the SDGs as a collective framework uh, for all levels of governments, of course, is is, an, is one of those interesting tools that can can involve citizens, can involve different kind of stakeholders, and then pushing uh, by having that same data set, that same kind of understanding of level of progress made. So we have in the last uh, the last decades developed a couple of real strong frameworks that allow us maybe to shift also this discussion on multi-level governance because we have the SDGs, we have the Paris Agreement, and so forth. Um, I would like maybe to, uh, if I can, uh, to call out uh, Remy uh, Sichiping, who has been, uh, who's leading uh, this governance work in New Habitat, to maybe exactly, I mean, Remy, you've worked on this for quite a long time, uh, and, and maybe reflect on what you've heard so far, both from the participants, uh, from the speakers, and from the participants, and maybe see uh, highlight some of the important things from your point of view. Remy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, very, very delighted uh, that this uh, conversation uh, finally had taken place. Uh, we had the opportunity from uh, listening inwards and, you know, outwards. Uh, and I think the, the discussion had been very frank, open and I noticed that uh, many of us or many of you have been quite generous with your ideas, suggestions, which are timely. Um, I would just perhaps, uh, without uh, repeating some of the things that have been said, just uh, from our perspective of why do we take some of this uh, rich conversation uh, or what can we make out of that, uh, to highlight that we, we see very much clearly that there is um, there are many actors, partners out there that are working on that, that are yearning to work collaboratively on that, um, on the urban governance. Uh, from the thematic entry point, from the institutional uh, point, from the 